Chapman, and can I welcome you all to today's meeting of the Public Petitions Committee. And as always, can I ask everyone to switch off their electronic devices because it does uh, interfere with our sound systems. Uh, we have apologies today from Jackson Carlo, who is attending the Health and Sport Committee, and Cameron Buchanan is in uh, his attendance as his substitute. Um, the next item of business is the round table discussion on PE 1319 on improving youth football in Scotland. Members of a note by the clerks, paper one, and a submission from the petitioners. Uh, could I welcome everyone to the meeting and thank you all for coming along today. We've had uh, apologies from Malcolm McGregor, uh, who's an advocate from Compass Chambers, as he's got to be in court today. Um, can I start by asking if everyone can introduce themselves? Um, uh, my name is David Stewart. I'm a Labour MSP from the Highlands and Islands uh, region. And perhaps I could declare, as always, uh, the fact that I'm a trustee of Inverness Cali Thistle. But obviously, any comments I make are purely my own, and I can't speak for my club. Otherwise, I'm in serious trouble at my next home game. So, Chick. I'm Chick Brody. I'm the SNP MSP for uh, the South of Scotland. And John Murray, Cameron Director, Harman Lothian Football Club. Good morning and welcome. Um, it's Anne McTaggart, the MSP for Glasgow. Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Robertson, uh, one half of the, the real grassroots. I've come dressed today because I, I wanted to make the point I'm just a, a football coach, uh, like tens of thousands of other volunteers across Scotland. Hey, good morning. Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East. Good morning. My name is Willie Smith. I'm the chairman and founder of Hillwood Boys Club in Glasgow and also the co-founder of realgrassroots.co.uk. Good morning, I'm Cameron Buchanan, Conservative MSP for Lothian. Good morning, uh, Neil Doncaster, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Professional Football League, which is the newly merged league representing all 42 professional football clubs in Scotland. Good morning, David Torrance, MSP Kirkcaldy Constituency. I declare a registered interest uh, as a member of the RAFE Trust. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I'm Andrew McKinley. I'm the Director of Football Governance and Regulation at the Scottish Football Association. Good morning. I'm John Wilson, SNP MSP for Central Scotland. Uh, thank you, colleagues. So the purpose of the roundtable is to enable everyone here to discuss the issues of training, compensation and contracts involving young players, as raised by the petitions of William Smith and Scott Robertson. Um, could you just ask, um, in terms of the contributions, if you can make your contributions uh, through myself, that would be uh, very helpful. Um, and we've got around um, an hour for this really important discussion. And again, I would like to thank everyone for giving up their really valuable time to be here, because that really helps, I think, the quality of the debate that we will get uh, today. Um, so could I start perhaps by just uh, asking a couple of questions, then I'll ask my uh, colleagues uh, to I'll ask uh, someone a number of questions. And again, if you uh, feel that you're best qualified to answer, just please indicate. The first question is, what changes in policy and law have taken place since the petition was first raised in 2010? And in a typical political way, I'll probably answer my own question by saying, uh, I know that the Bernard ruling of the European Court of Justice uh, which basically have said that the costs of training young players must not, or the actual transfer fee element, must not exceed the actual costs of training of individual players. Um, who feels they're best qualified to come in on that particular issue? Yes. Mr. Uh, McGinley. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, th there are a number of areas where we have made changes since the, the initial petition. Um, we've been involved in quite a number of discussions with both uh, Mr. Smith uh, and Mr. Robertson. One of the main changes that we, we have made is in relation to uh, the reimbursement of uh, training costs. Um, I think it should, it's important to note that this is set against a backdrop uh, that FIFA, the International uh, Football uh, Federation, uh, require uh, associations to have in place uh, a system to reward clubs for investing in the training and education of players. So it's a mandatory requirement for associations uh, to have that. One issue, I think, in the past was that there were, there were two uh, sets of, of uh, uh, reimbursement of training costs. One was governed by ourselves, one was governed by uh, the, the SPL, uh, and the SFL, as it was at that time, just used the same one as, was, as us. Some of the figures uh, in there were seen as being uh, fairly random, and it was unclear as to how they had uh, an association with the costs that were actually being spent. Uh, so what we did was we undertook an exercise uh, to look at the costs that were uh, spent by clubs in relation to the training and development of players, uh, it became clear to us that there was a, a, a clear correlation between what was spent and the star ratings that clubs had in relation to uh, our Club Academy Scotland scheme. Because of that, we've set up a new uh, matrix-type system 
um, which looks at uh, basically uh, the higher up uh, you are, the more you've spent and the more that you would expect to get in relation to uh, the reimbursement of uh, training costs. In tandem with that, we've also brought in two new rules, uh, making it quite clear that no, no rights of compensation that a club may have shall prevent a player from moving to a new club. Uh, it was seen in the past that um, uh, the, the, club was, the club that was due the compensation was actually stopping the player from moving to a new club. And we've put in a rule so that a club can't, can't do that. Uh, on, a limited, on the limited occasions where we have had issues, I would say in the last two years since I've been at the association, uh, this has been sort of less than a handful, we are brought in effectively as mediators. Uh, we, we help with the clubs, uh, with the, the parents, uh, with the players, uh, to look for a, a compromise uh, situation to hopefully uh, get the player um, uh, released to, to the new club. So that's probably the biggest area. There are other areas, however, where we've also uh, made changes, uh, as, as, as the real grassroots uh, guys are aware. One of them is in relation to the registration and licensing of team scouts. We brought in new rules uh, around that to put in place uh, a new process uh, so that senior clubs have to uh, register their team scouts. Uh, and um, uh, that, I think, has been, has been quite successful. There was also an issue around where players were released from Club Academy Scotland clubs, uh, and um, they seemed to go into the ether, so to speak, lost to football. That's not a good thing. So we've, again, set up something whereby information is passed back to the Scottish Youth Football Association to sometimes reunite those players with the clubs they may have come from originally, or, or, or any other club to hopefully not, not lose them uh, to football. Um, and one other area where I know there's, um, uh, there was a significant issue around the fact that players within Club Academy Scotland were not allowed to play for their school teams. Uh, the rule has been changed such that um, they can play for their school teams, but it is still at the discretion of the Club Academy Scotland club. Uh, I would say, after having quite a number of discussions uh, with various people involved in that, that generally clubs do provide support in that area and many players who are uh, Club Academy Scotland players uh, do still play for their, their, school, their school teams. So that gives you a, a broad uh, overview of a number of areas where we have made changes in the last couple of years. Uh, thank you. I think Mr Doncaster wants to come in. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you to Andrew for that uh, helpful uh, exposition of the changes that the SFA have, uh, have made. Uh, we have also uh, made changes. Um, we've been working closely with the Scottish Football Association since the merger last summer. Uh, one of the areas where uh, last time uh, when I was here uh, in this room there was uh, concern was over the allegations that, that players were somehow being auctioned, young players, and that uh, uh, clubs where uh, interest was uh, registered by another club, an acquiring club, were not passing all that information to the young players. So the rules have been changed from uh, this summer which means that uh, any club wishing to acquire the registration of a, an amateur young player registers that interest with us, the league, and we pass that interest on to the player and his parents. So the player and his parents then have a choice as to what they do. They are in full uh, possession of all the facts of any uh, clubs that are interested in, in signing them. And indeed, uh, if that process is followed, then there is then a, uh, a prohibition on any inducement being offered either by the uh, club wishing to acquire the player uh, or his current club uh, to offer any inducement to stay or to go. Thank you for that. Um, could I bring in um, uh, either William Smith or Scott Robertson just to perhaps throw their comments in? I think Mr Smith here. Two things I'd like to say, I can be first and foremost, um, it is true to say that the Scottish Football Association have been more than helpful in terms of sitting down with us and talking to us about issues. Sadly, I cannot say that about the Scottish Professional Football League. They have shown no interest, no enthusiasm to speak to us about any matter in relation to what is very serious issues under their control. We have attended, as Andrew rightly said, several meetings, some of which uh, we're grateful for were at the invitation of the Scottish Football Association and we have a good working relationship with them. I cannot say that that exists because we've never been invited. However, I do wish to take up uh, the point insofar as uh, this uh, bartering with a 13 or a 14 year old. Mr Sinclair from Rangers Football Club, supported by uh, Mr McCart from Celtic Football Club, stated in this room, as Mr Doncaster said, about the situation 
with regards to a young player um, <clears throat> who was being traded off between two professional football clubs to the highest bidder. And I would ask anybody sitting around this table as a parent, how would you like your son to be in that situation? The rule, insofar as that Mr Doncaster has just uh, emphasised, is now in place that parents must be informed. It is four years, four years since Mr Sinkler gave that evidence, supported by Mr McCart, and that's it, just been introduced this summer. I think that reflects the arrogance that is involved in that organisation headed by Mr Doncaster. The clubs in, in that are only interested in getting whatever money they can out of a young potential player. That is all they're interested in. Some of them don't even have the facilities to potentially justify the claim for that money. And we are concerned about that incident in particular. And I hope, I know that the committee has changed since the first meeting four years ago in January, uh, sorry, 2010, but the meeting at Mr. Sinkler appeared in 2011 when he gave that evidence. It's important, convener, to mention that we wrote to Mr. Doncaster after that meeting asking him to investigate the credibility of Mr. Sinkler's evidence <coughs> and Mr. McCart's evidence. He refused to do so, stressing that there had been no breach of rules. And yet he wrote to uh, one of our supporters who helped us with this petition, former MSP Trish Godman. He wrote, referring to the <coughs> Oliver Bernard case, in which he outlined uh, some points on it. What he didn't outline was that the European Court ruling in the Oliver Bernard case said that no, only the cost could be met. We have profiteering in our game, and it is wrong. Thank, thank you very much. Um, could just say, obviously, we're quite tight for time. We've got quite a lot of questions. So um, politicians are well used, of course, to making speeches. But I would ask, perhaps, uh, witnesses are a bit shorter on their contributions. That would be useful. Um, uh, Mr. Robertson, did you want to add anything briefly on uh, the points we were making? Yeah, I'll be as brief as I can, convener. Um, I I'm glad to hear, and I'm aware of the, the changes that the SFA have made. Um, I got a copy of the document. I, I don't quite understand if you have 16 kids on a training pitch um, and a coach or two coaches, how it's more expensive for Celtic to do it than it might be for Adrianians, for example. So we have um, a system where it, it's calculated for a, a star six rated club. It's £15,000 as the compensation level, but it's clearly less for a, a one star club. I'm not... I don't get that part. Maybe that can be answered at some point. Um, I'm glad to hear that there's a rule uh, brought in uh, which stops clubs preventing kids from playing football. I wasn't aware of that. Um, what I'm aware of, uh, there's two cases that are running just now, and we can maybe come back uh, and get an answer. But, you know, there's a kid here that's, that's been in touch with us. He hasn't been playing football since the 25th of June last year. This is a talented player, this is a player that was on professional books, hasn't been able to play football because compensation has not been paid. I've got his player passport printed off in front of me, but that's fact. There's another lad, uh, 21st of November last year, hasn't been registered or been playing football because clubs cannot agree on the levels of compensation. It seems to, to, to fly in the face, unfortunately, Andrew, from, from what you've said. Um, so so I, I take a bit of issue with that. Um, and finally, the, the, the exit strategy. Yes, the SFA now send an email in spreadsheet form in Excel to the Scottish Youth FA. Last week there was 19 players released. The Scottish Youth FA don't know what to do with that list and sit on it. So that information is not then sent to clubs, whether it's Musselboro Windsor or Hillwood Boys Club. So if we're getting 19 players a week, released from professional clubs. They're sitting in a database doing nothing because the Scottish Youth FA don't know under the Data Protection Act whether they can send me John Smith lives in Musselburgh and plays right back. Here's his address and telephone number. So that is not the, the full answer. Thank you. you. That obviously we're out trying to get a later stage. I think Mr Murray, you were coming. Yes, I'd like to say regarding the Ebrionian and Celtic thing, I obviously don't understand the criteria around the Club Academy Scotland. Celtic have one of the top academies in Britain, and they employ full-time scouts and coaches. 
they employ qualified coaches and various other physiotherapists that cost money. Airbnb told us that same criteria. So there's a lot more money paid by Celtic than there is by Hearts. And that's a fact. Celtic Rangers pay fortunes for their academies, a lot more than any other club. So the compensation is based around the, the level of sick coach they are. So Airbnb might have four teams, Celtic might have six teams plus development squads, and development down to 20 teams. So a lot more people are involved in Celtic and Rangers than most clubs in Scotland, not Britain. Regarding the compensation Mr Sinclair quoted, I think the figure he gave you is actually wrong. I think there's no reason for him to pay that money for any player in Scotland. There's a set figure, and I believe the player went for that figure, not the figure he quoted. I know what Mr Sinclair said, and I was appalled at what he said at the meeting, but I can assure you that I would pay not one penny more than training compensation required under legislation for any player in Scotland. And I think, um, you know, we're not here as lawyers, but I mean, that, that's my understanding of what the Bernard ruling is identifying, isn't it? It's a bit cross. Um, I'm conscious my other colleagues have got questions as well, so I'll quickly go to my uh, next question. Um, I suppose asking the sort of very straightforward question is, why is registration for young players required at all? What's the benefit of a young player of being registered? And the, one of the uh, quotes we got from the briefing for this meeting was that the Age of Legal Capacity Scotland Act 1991 provides that a person under 16 years of age has no legal capacity uh, subject to exceptions and generally contracts with minors are voidable. I don't know whether Mr McKinley or Mr Doncaster wants to say anything on that. I'll, I'll take the second point uh, about the, the Age of Legal Capacity. At one of the first meetings I, I had with um, uh, the real grassroots uh, gentleman, um, the point was made that uh, anyone under uh, 16 it would be unlawful for them to enter into these, these agreements. Uh, and that they said that they had council's opinion to that effect. So I asked if they would share that with me, and they did. Kindly shared uh, Mr. Uh, uh, McGregor's opinion with me. It's, it's, un it's unfortunate he's not with us today, um, but I can assure you his opinion does not say that it's unlawful. Um, uh, uh, people of that age can enter into contracts. Their parents that enter into them on their behalf and if there's an issue around the parent entering into a contract that's not in the best interests of the child, then that issue is between the child and the parent. Um, so they are not per se void uh, or avoidable. Um, so that's just my, my the legal response to, and that, that's their own council's opinion. Um, Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Doncaster. Yeah, I'll take the first part of the, the the question in terms of what's the point of a, a registration system. Well, it's a record of exactly where young players are, who, who they're training with, but primarily it also provides the basis for insurance for those players. And we insure uh, the clubs, uh, and we insure, uh, have a system of insurance for the league and all of its member clubs, and of course that covers uh, players within those clubs. So there are good legal reasons why there should be a system of registration. Thank you for that. Then, uh, Mr Murray? Please don't the form that our player signs the same form the boys club players sign. Exactly the same registration form. It's not a contract. So the forms that my players sign for Hearts are the same forms that most of our ones are signed and boys' club sign. It's exactly the same form. So we can't do it, why can they do it? It's exactly the same form, which is registered legally by the SFA and SPL. So I'd, I'd like to know what the difference between their forms and my forms. Okay, uh, Mr Smith? I don't know what John Murray knows about boys' club football, <clears throat> but it appears to me to be absolutely nothing. The fact is that there are no forums in boys club football where a child signs at 15 years of age for a one year registration and the club that he signs for, my club, Hillwood Boys Club, do not have the right under SYFA rules to continue that player's registration against his wishes. That's the bottom line on that, Mr Murray. So um, as far as that is concerned, that is completely wrong. The, sim <coughs> the simple fact is why do we have to, and I would ask Mr Doncaster and Mr McKinley to explain this, why does a 15-year-old child have to sign a registration document at that age when professional footballers are free of it through Bosman, when the Scottish Junior Football Association from this year have scrapped it? Why is it that we, that, that we target a 15-year-old child to continue his registration after it, he completes that? I'll, I'll allow Mr Murray quickly. I could just say as well, I know there's quite strong feelings around this, but I just ask that we try and deal with each other with courtesy. It's quite useful. Yeah, Mr Murray? There's the same form you sign. And what we say, Bosman applies to players over 23, not 15-year-olds. So players are free in a Bosman at 23 old, not under 23. So I'm not aware of what you know about European rules or registration forms, but that is a fact. Thank players you. are free to go at 23 up, not under 23. And that uh, is a fact. Thank you. Could I just bring in Mr. Doncaster and Mr. McKinley about the points raised by Mr. Smith? 
I'm happy to endorse what, what John's response just was. Um, the, the Bosman ruling does apply to players over 23. Uh, the FIFA system of compensation for training uh, uh, effectively, which has been endorsed by the ECJ in the Barnard case, uh, makes it clear that compensation for players below the age of 23 is entirely permissible and, and within European law. And just to follow on the, my initial question, but that, that's where the burner drilling comes in, is it? So basically the compensation sh should reflect the costs by the club of the training. But absolutely, and that, what we put in place is a system that aims to do exactly that. And depending upon the star rating of the uh, academy uh, from which the player comes. Uh, and it's because not, not everyone on this table will be experts on football, as you gentlemen are. So it, just so I fully understand this issue, um, the Bernard ruling states that there can be a compensation if a player leaves, which reflects the star rating um, of the facility. So Celtic, as we just heard, will have an, an expensive setup to reflect the size of the club they are. So if a player from Celtic goes from one club to another, the other club must pay a compensation that reflects the actual costs of training that player for Celtic. But there's no premium above that. Exactly. And what yeah. I've talked about in terms of the changes to our rules this summer effectively prevents any... I mean, there was an allegation of auctioning of young players previously. Uh, our rules from this summer prevent that from happening because the player would be alerted by us to any interest in that player uh, and the compensation sums are set out very clearly in the rules. Bring in John Wilson before I bring in Ms McKinley. John Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Just on that point, we've got entered into evidence for today's meeting a letter uh, copied to Mr Smith from Vincent Lunny from the Scottish FA and basically says that the SP, SFA and the SPFL have set tariffs. However, there is no penalty if any club decides to breach those tariffs. So do we have tariffs in place that are actually set for and taking on board Mr Murray's point about the six-star club versus the one-star club? Uh, if these tariffs are in place, then if we have those tariffs, how can clubs continue to breach those tariffs without any penalties being applied to them? Mr McKinley? I'll, I'll take that first. The, the, the letter that's referred to is from my colleague, Mr Lunny, who's the compliance officer within the association. This was a matter referred to him in general terms. I think it might have been a, a, a referral back <coughs> to Mr Sinclair's evidence of several years ago that extra money was being paid. There is nothing in our rules specifically to say that if extra money is paid, it's a breach of our rules because I actually don't understand how extra money uh, can be paid under the new tariff system. It just doesn't. So we don't generally put in rules in place when it can't happen. Um, Mr Doncaster will, will probably talk further about their new rules, which prevent them from... We have two sets of rule books, so that very much touches upon our rules, and uh, I'm sure Mr Doncaster will speak to the SPFL rules. Mr Doncaster? It's exactly the same. So within uh, the SPFL, the 42 clubs... Uh, any uh, young player going from one club to another club within the 42 uh, is covered by uh, that system, which sets out exactly what the training compensation should be uh, for each size of club. And, so and so they, they, if, they, if we take a scenario that a, a club with big pockets um, says, I really, I really want to sign this uh, young player who's aged 15, um, the, the host club will negotiate what the compensation is based on their costs. Now, how does it then no, work? The, the, the compensation is set out very clearly in the rules as to exactly what is payable. The club, the, the big club with large pockets you've described, who wishes to acquire that player, would write to us. We would then alert the player and his parents, and he then has a choice as to whether he stays with his existing club or whether he goes at the end of uh, that uh, year uh, to, the, to the new club. If he goes, then the compensation is set out in the rules. So if, uh, if the um, large club says to the parents, this is the compensation scheme, because that's laid down in the rules, but we wish to pay and make you another payment to reflect this, is that, that, is, did, that can is that pro happen? That is prohibited by our rules, would be a breach of our rules, and it would be a disciplinary case that we would then bring right. if we had yes, evidence sure. of a breach. Um, can I bring in Chick Brody? Good morning. Has there been a breach of the rules, to your knowledge, and what investigations have you carried out in these circumstances to make sure that the rules are being complied with? Because I have a suspicion. I'm not aware of any breach of our rules, and if anyone has have any... Have you checked? Evidence, well, we, we have a... Uh, have a you checked the payments in total that are made in a circumstance that's just been uh, I'm, in I'm, terms of additional payments? Sorry, Mr Brodie, I'm, I'm not sure I follow what you're suggesting. If we have evidence 
of any breach of our rules, then we will investigate that. We have no such evidence before us whatsoever. We don't go on fishing expeditions to look for alleged breaches. If people have allegations of wrongdoing, if people have allegations of breaches of our rules, they should bring that evidence to us and we will investigate. We've seen no such evidence. So you do not enforce any compliance or do any auditing or do any, it's not fishing expedition. We're talking about young men uh, and indeed young girls uh, as will be playing a sport they enjoy. So you do no, what shall we call it, your fishing expeditions to ensure these rules are being complied with? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't follow. If people are alleging that rules have been breached, let's see what that allegation is. Let's see what the evidence is. I have no such evidence uh, in front of me at all. Okay. okay. Thank you. Could I just perhaps move on, because I know there's a number of questions from members of the committee. Could I bring in Cameron Buchanan? Why do registrations for those under 15 differ from, the, from, 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 from players aged 14 and under? I mean, why the, why the, why, what's the 15-year-old barrier? What's that? Is that arbitrary? It comes from the, the clubs. Um, we, we are a members' organisation, therefore our rules come from, obviously, uh, the wishes of the clubs. Um, it was very much viewed, a uh, discussion several years ago, that that is seen as the crucial um, age for uh, the development of the players when they reach that 15. Before that, the clubs are happy after one year that they can go on, but at that age they feel that they've made a sufficient commitment and therefore um, th they should be allowed to keep the player for, for, for those years. That's why there's a, there's a difference. Now, I don't, John might be able to add to that as well. What we say is that young players from 13 to probably 15 or 14 go through, they go through puberty, they do growing pains, they have Osgood slatters, various illnesses, and players through that time deteriorate, their form goes off for a while. We think at 15, most players come through their, their growth spurt, and we can judge them better what their quality of ability is. So we like to make sure that the investment we put there is kept longer, up until 16 or 17. And it's purely the fact that young ages, players go up and down like yo-yos, their, their quality goes up. They go through. We've had players that club for one year who are injured with all good slatters. Yeah, so we protect that player and keep them for another year through injury. Yeah. We think at 15 yeah. we can better assess the quality of that player and try and keep our investment in that player going on a lot longer. And that's basically why it's done. So, so, so 15 is then arbitrary, effectively. It's not, it's not a particular rule. It's one that you've imposed or, 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 or regulated. Yeah, what he says. Yes. I understand this. Thank you. Yes, Scott Robertson. Thank you, convener. Um, the comment was made that Bosman doesn't apply unless it's a player that's 23 uh, years or older. And, and we understand that. What we're suggesting is the principle should also apply to young players. If, and the registration form, Mr Murray's correct, the form is the same, but the rules behind it, the front-facing form is the same, but the rules behind it are different. I'll give you a couple of examples. If a player signs in his 13 a registration form for a boys' club, should he decide halfway through, or for family reasons, he wants to leave and move somewhere else, or just that's a, put upon him by the family moving? He can do so. 28 days, he writes into the Scottish Youth FA. Now, the same registration form, he cannot exit from Adrianians, or Hearts, or Hibs, or Celtic. There is no such get-out clause, if you like. If we move that up to a 15-year-old, and although I, you know, I hear Andrew and he said he didn't say it was illegal, Malcolm McGregor said the current regime is flawed. It imposes a contractual regime on young players and clubs in which the former are placed in a clear and distinct advantage, disadvantage in which they have no bargaining power and effectively no remedial rights. So if you're 15 and you sign a registration form, and you complete that season, that commitment for one year, the club, and only the club, can hold you for a second year. The player has no say in it whatsoever. He has no get-out clause. At the end of that second year, if, he wants, if the club wants to keep you for a third year, they have the power and the authority to do that. The player and the parent have no say in that. And there's a number of organisations, whether it's the Scottish Youth FA, Malcolm McGregor for Congress Chambers, Bridge Litigation, FIF Pro, retaining players after they've expressed a right to leave after a season is not acceptable, said FIF Pro. This infringes fundamental rights. We heard the same from Tam Bailey, the Children's Commissioner. It was reflected in the FIFA Disciplinary Committee when they dealt with Barcelona. 
William Gibbons wrote in and expressed the same point. The Scottish Trade Union Congress, the Scottish Child Law Centre, even Henry McLeish flagged up a duty of care that was absent. Thank you, Mr Robertson. Um, I'll bring in Mr Murray and then I could bring in Mr McKinley. First of all, any player, the reason why the players go to Leeds Band is 15, 16, we, we have the number of players in each squad. So when we get the 15 to go to 17, we reduce the amount of players in the system, which I thought was what you were after in the first place. So if we've squatted 15, 16, 17, we basically would have 48 players in our system, or 54 players. We go on the dual age, but we go on by the theme the the of registration, we, we have to move the players in the club. So we go from 30, say 44 players to 22 players. So we actually do what you're asking, reduce the amount of players. Plus we have a duty of care to all our players. To say that the parent can't leave is wrong. I've let a player go this week at 14 who moved house. So that is up to the individual club. I would be appalled the club keeping a player who moved house. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Regarding your, your thing about principles, we all have different principles. Clubs work with different principles. I certainly wouldn't keep a player who moved house. And that's my individual club. I can't speak for the or Celtic. But some of the points you're making are, are completely wrong. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Could I bring Mr. McGinley to perhaps look at the points that uh, Mr. Robertson has raised? Thank, thank you very much. Um, there, were, there were a few issues in there. I'll try and pick up on some of them. I may miss, uh, miss some. Uh, we're throwing around quite a few analogies and examples. I think we've got to be very careful when we do that because a lot of them, as lawyers will know, turn very much in the facts and circumstances. Bosman has been thrown around a lot this morning. There is nothing in Bosman to prevent clubs from having one-way options to extend contracts. Bosman is about someone that comes to the end of their contract and has no contract whatsoever. The Barcelona case has just been thrown up. Barcelona case is all about... Uh, the movement of miners from South America to Spain. I think we're getting ourselves a little bit excited if, if we look. FIFA have very clear rules on the movement of miners cross-border. Uh, this was to do with boys, uh, uh, young, young boys, who were brought from South America uh, to Spain. So I don't think that is an example that we should, we should be using. Family reasons, John Murray has, has talked about them. Where there have been issues and clubs haven't maybe had the same principles as John has talked about, um, again, there's been a couple of times when we've been asked to mediate, and generally we can find a situation where we can, we can compromise. We are allowed to cancel a registration if it comes to that. Now, we don't use that lightly, but in scenarios where it's obvious that the club is abusing its, its position, then we do have the, the authority to do that. Very briefly, because I'm getting a bit short of time and there's lots of questions. Mr. Referred to Mr. Doncaster, the, the, the question from Mr. Brody. Mr. Doncaster said there was absolutely no evidence in that case. That is the extract of evidence from Jim, Jim Sinclair, Mr. Doncaster, that you sat and listened to, where a child was traded off against two clubs. I could just say that, obviously, for the official record, that can't be picked up. Is it possible you could give us that, a copy of that information yes. so that we could well, then... Well, you have that in the official... Right. There's Jim Sinclair's evidence oh, for this right. petitions committee. Thank you. Now, Mr Doncaster was there. He got that evidence. He declared to Mr Brodie he didn't have any evidence to investigate. We wrote to him and provided him again with all the evidence. He refused to investigate. We passed it on in an official complaint form to Vincent Lunny, the compliance uh, chap from the SFA. Mr Lunny came back to his right and said, I can't speak. We asked him to uh, uh, interview Mr Doncaster about the, Mr Sinclair's evidence. He refused to do it. We asked him to interview Jimmy Sinclair for Rangers FC. He refused to do, uh, he refused to do that as well. So... Uh, it shows the lack of cooperation that we've had in that context. Thank you. Um, perhaps bring Mr Doncaster in, since you were mentioned in dispatches. Do you have any comments on that, Mr Doncaster? Yeah, I, I find myself at a loss to understand uh, what this campaign is, is aiming to achieve. If there is an allegation that rules have been breached, let's understand what rule we think has been breached. And let's see some evidence. Because we are not aware of any uh, uh, evidence of any rule having been breached. We are concerned... Uh, about what, we, uh, what was put in front uh, of us when we were here last time uh, in terms of the, the allegations about auctioning young players. And as I've already explained this morning, we've put in place a system that ensures that there should be no incentive for that to happen. We will alert any player uh, if there is any interest from him by a, a club seeking to acquire his registration. If there's an allegation that a rule has been breached in the past, Let's see the evidence of that and let's understand what rule we think has been breached. Marty? I would like to find out what the figure was that Rangers Celtic paid for that player. 
because I am aware that the figure they paid was not the figure that was spoken at this meeting. And there was no need for anyone to pay over the figure that was asked for. Yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah. Um, can I just ask, say that we've got quite a lot of other questions, and rather we keep to the, the broader principles rather than individual players, because it gets. Then what happens is that we miss some of the major points, and we have to move on. Um, Mr. Brodie, it's your Thank question. You. Um, one thing that's always concerned me, about, in particular given the state of Scottish football, why we have still two organisations running our sport. How sure are you that you're? applying the regulations in the same way. Yeah, Mr. Doncaster. Um, virtually, I think there's, there may be one other country in Europe, one country in Europe where you have a unitary setup of a league and FA working together. Uh, other than that one country, I'm, I'm not aware of any other country in Europe that operates that unitary system. I'm Scotland. Well, Scotland matches the situation in the vast majority of countries around Europe where you have one league or two leagues and then a governing body. And that separation is very much the case elsewhere in Europe. Our role as a, a league is to run a fair competition for the 42 members, the professional clubs, and largely to commercialise that and to run the, the competition for those members. We work hand in hand with the governing body who live down the corridor from us at Hamden. We cooperate on a daily basis I see Andrew and, and his colleagues daily. Uh, there is a good level of cooperation, and in fact, we're working together, given the uh, separate rule books that we have, to ensure that there, where there is overlap, where there is uh, uh, rules touching with the same things, we are very, very clear about who takes priority on each of them. So there is an extremely good working relationship, and, and where there are issues that, that arise, uh, that are brought to us, we work with the SFA to look at them. Uh, and, and the suggestions that we're not listening, we don't care, uh, that couldn't be further from the truth. Well, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting you don't listen, don't care, uh, but you've just said that you know, processes overlap, you, talk, you walk up and down the corridor talking to each other about, you know, and this is a, a very serious issue uh, as far as I'm concerned. It's almost, reading this is like reading a Dick, Dickensian novel in some cases. Uh, you know, what, why do we need particularly where we're, we're looking at youngsters and trying to foster them for the good of football, why do we need two bodies to oversee the, the, the compliance and the registration? Well, there is a single system that's been agreed with the 42 clubs and with the, the Scottish FA that's now in place that deals with compensation based on star rating of academies. So there's one system. OK. Let me, let me just move on to another thing. Can you tell me, Mr McKinley, in terms of the public funds that are distributed by the SFA. What's the audit process on that? That's probably not my area of remit, Mr Brodie, I must admit. Um, I, I, if you can do now, I'm happy to take you know, to, for you to write in, but it seems there's a fair amount of public funds going through Sports Scotland to, to foster uh, young footballers, and yet I don't see any evidence of what the audit process is, where the money goes, how do we follow the money? What I would say is, uh, having read the evidence from, I think, 2010, when Mr Doncaster and Mr Regan and uh, I think the Minister, uh, Ms Robinson, gave uh, evidence to this committee, that was explored uh, in depth. And um, they talked about that whole audit process and Sports Scotland do come in and audit it. I just don't want to pretend that I'm an expert in that area and try yes, and sir. mislead you in any way. But I do think that this committee went over that in, in depth and, and, and that was explained in, in depth to the committee previously. Can I ask both of you then, in terms of the registration, to what extent can a registration be considered? And this obviously depends on the frame of reference that the, of the solicitors that you're, you're, you're discussing with. But to what extent can a registration be considered a contract between the club and the player stroke player's parents? Ms McKinley? Yeah. Football works and it has two separate things. It has a registration form and it has a, a player contract. And the people we're talking about here do not enter into football player contracts. They uh, enter into to registration forms. I think, again, this was rehearsed quite a lot um, in, in the 2010 that we can get into legal semantics about what is and what isn't a contract. But certainly football's view is these are registration forms. They are signed by um, the, the, the child and the, their parent but they do not sign what football views as football contracts. Those are for professional players. Mr Doncaster, do you want to comment? 
Anything I can add to that? That's just uh, a couple of very brief questions. To what extent are the obligations placed on young players, is there a barrier for them to move to other clubs, particularly in situations, let's say, as we just heard about uh, someone wanting, who's moving away from the local area? Uh, I mean, why in these circumstances, given that we're trying to encourage youngsters to enjoy, not be a means of speculation, what, um, to what extent do you think the obligations are placed on a young player in, in terms of that barrier? Mr Murray touched upon the fact that there are many clubs that, that don't put that up as a barrier. So even in the middle of the year, if a family moves, then they often will let them go. Um, it's, it's not in the club's best interest to hold on to a player that, that doesn't want to be there. As I said earlier in response to another question where there have been issues, less than a handful in my two years in the association have been brought to me around this matter. Um, I think only one has been brought to me where a club has refused to let uh, a, a player go. We, we have become involved and we've managed to, to get to a situation where reaching an amicable compromise and the player has been released. So it's not something that's been brought to my attention on a daily basis that this is happening all the time. If it was, I would be horrified. <coughs> you have no evidence? No not, that's, not that's been brought to my attention. Okay. Uh, Mr. Murray, did you have a brief question? Yeah, I would say that when the parents come in to sign the registration form, they're explained with the training compensation. They're explained what happens at the end of the season. They're given reviews during the season about their performance. And every, every player at the end of the year can, can leave and go to a boys' club or go anywhere they want. The, the club come to them. No players are unhappy unless someone comes for them. 99% 90, of the players who sign for clubs are happy until maybe a, a bigger club come for them. And then they have to, the training comes in sort of, but we have a lot of players at the end of the year, maybe we let them be players, maybe two players go per age group, for argument's sake. And some of the boys go to another senior club or go back to boys club. There are very few players leave in terms of football and don't play football. They either go to a smaller club in the, in the club academy of Scotland or back to a boys club. So the idea that the players are lost to the game is absolute nonsense. These boys go and find a level to play at every year. Thank you. Is it, Check Brody, you yeah, did just very quickly. I, mean, I, I hear what you say, Mr. Bunny. Uh, and uh, we're all doing the best for the, for the youngsters. And then I heard earlier that in some cases they may not be allowed to play for the schools. Right? So, you know, what we have to recognise, what I read into this is, what we're talking about is speculating about young men and young women uh, wanting to play the game that they wish. That's what it's about. It's not about anything other than pure business speculation and using young people and, 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 li and limiting their ability to do the thing they enjoy most. And, for example, saying you can't play school football, I think is an absolute nonsense. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Right. Mr. Uh, Mr. McKinley? Point. What I actually said earlier on was that generally clubs do release players to play for their school teams. Uh, again, there was a lot of discussion about this when it last came before this committee that there are the boys that maybe have played five, six, seven times a week for, and, and John will be able to give more information on this for the Club Academy Scotland. I don't think we want to burn out young people either. I think we've got to be very careful with this. I'm conscious of time, so I need to move on to John Wilson. Thank you, uh, Once again, the, this issue about registration uh, and the procedures around whether or not how someone would challenge the registration process uh, and the, whether or not, and you, Mr McKinley, you made reference to one challenge that you were aware of in the last two years. Uh, it's just so that we can be clear if parents and guardians and the young players themselves are aware of the procedures if they want to challenge the registration process and how they would go about that and who would hear that challenge, what body is responsible for hearing the challenge. If it's our registration rules, which is most likely to be, generally what happens in the first instance is that uh, the, the parents, uh, where there's an issue, have spoken to uh, one of the mem our members of staff who heads up the whole Club Academy Scotland regime. And in many cases, he's able to uh, sort things out before it actually gets into uh, a, an argument over our regulations. If there's evidence to show, or the, 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 a belief that there's evidence to show that the regulations have been, been, been breached, then that should be sent in to either myself, to the Chief Executive. In either case, we would pass the matter to the Compliance Officer, who would consider whether there had been a breach of the regulations, and if there had been a breach of the regulations, would then take the appropriate action against the club. I think Mr Smith, you want to come in. 
But just to enlighten you a little, you said there's only been a handful of cases since you started with the SFA in so far as disputes were concerned. We've already had a case that was almost going to court until a, a, a professional football club withdrew from holding the player on compensation and let him go for nothing. We are currently waiting on word from the legal aid board on behalf of another player to take a club to court over refusal to uh, release him from his contract. So to suggest that there's only been a couple, we've got another one pending, so it's obviously more relevant, uh, Andrew, than you, you have knowledge of. Yeah, and just before you come in, just a, a quick warn, warning. Obviously, we have to be careful about talking about any ongoing legal cases, so the appreciative members don't mention the name of the case. Mr McKinley? I can, I can only speak to ones that are brought to my attention, obviously. So. Just to, while I don't want to go into the individual detail of the court cases involved, it would be useful if Mr Smith could give an indication why it was felt necessary to go to the courts rather than go through the procedure that Mr McKinley's uh, indicated, and that's to go through the compliance officer and deal with it in that way rather than going to the expense of going to court. Mr Wilson, the facts are that in both instances, the parents exhausted the opportunities with the clubs first. There was no knowledge at parent level of what is available insofar as the next form of uh, approach. Other than Andrew Bryson, the Registration Secretary, was contacted in both cases and said, that's the rule, that's it, he's registered, they can claim compensation for him, full stop. And these parents have led us to that effect. Can we? Yeah, I can respond to the point. That the, the difference being is that these are probably not where there's a breach of rules. This is where someone actually feels they have to go to court because their belief is that our rules are somehow actually unlawful. It is a question of going to court because it is the only way we will get this issue resolved uh, other than this parliament is by going to court. So there's a ruling made on the 15-year-old contract where a club can hold someone against their wishes for two years. That's what's going to court. Mr Murray? I would say, in the last 18 years at Hearts, where I've tried to sign a player for a boys' club, it meant a lot of aggravation trying to get that done. If some boys' club refused to release the player's registration, so he could come to Hardham Lothian Football Club, as of other clubs. So it's not a one-way circle here. I've had players who, who leave boys' clubs, I want to sign them, and I've got to register the form, oh, he's still signed by the boys' club. Up until recently, boys' club registrations continued on for years. I can check a player on the SFA website who might be signed with a boys' club 18 months ago. Hopefully that has changed now. But I have situations in Edinburgh where I have people refuse to lease a player to come to Hearts. I, I perhaps bring in, if, can I bring in Ms MacDonald? Because I think his question will, will touch on this as well. Angus MacDonald? Yes, thanks. Convener, just uh, picking up on the points already made regarding uh, registration. Um, Andrew McKinley mentioned earlier that parents are closely involved in the registration process. Uh, and Scott Robertson uh, claimed this morning that uh, uh, there's no get-out clause, which, uh, which we heard was challenged by, by John Murray. Um, so, picking up on the points uh, raised by my colleagues Chick Brodie and uh, John Wilson, can you tell us what advice are young players and their parents or guardians given at the time that registration is being contemplated, uh, and what's done to make sure that uh, both the player and the parents or guardians uh, understand the, the implications involved? It's probably different from club to club, and John will be able to, to speak to hearts. Um, from my perspective, there is a, a form which uh, is signed by, uh, it's, it's not a long form, it's just over a page long. In fact, I think you can now get, actually get it on one side of A4. There are five clauses in it, and each of those clauses up until, uh, is signed by player, the parent and the club, and they go through each of those. It's not written in complicated legalistic language. I'm not saying, though, that in the particular heat of the moment that someone might just say, yes, I'll sign it, and off they, off they go. I'm not trying to pretend that might not happen, but I suspect there will be different practices from club to club, but it's certainly made, intentionally made, as simple as possible. Okay, it's my I've just been given the form here, so yeah, it looks fairly straightforward. Um, Mr. Murray, anyone else? Yes, we can sign a form for the SPL and the SFL, the SPFL, and the parents sign all documentation. 
There's also a club code of conduct and a, a player parent code of conduct. It is quite an intense registration process and the players are given the documentation explaining the sign for one year or it says on the registration form that it's a three year registration. And that's explained to all the parents, certainly my club and I, I believe most clubs. And I think that's a duty, of, duty we have to the players and the parents that know exactly what they're signing. Do you have a one-to-one -one with the parents or guardians? Every, every player signed at Hearts Football was signed with a guardian or a carer or a parent there, and the forms are explained to them. We go through a process with each individual parent, yes. Okay. In some cases, we bring them in as a squad, and we fill the forms, but they read all the forms before they sign them. Yeah, um, it was a move in the right direction that the parent had to sign in five different places and perhaps an indication of the, the poor practice that was going on that required them to bring in a form that they had to sign five times a registration. That's not something you do in youth football. Can I just, to kind of bring this uh, to sort of boiling point, the, That's always a word. <laughs> the, it's not the term I was going to, uh, <laughs> Mr Doncaster, what do we want? Um, yes, compensation uh, is allowed by FIFA. Myself and Willie perhaps argue that maybe compensation should be paid to a training club once a player turns professional, not while they're 12 and 13. The other thing we want, and I would ask the members of the committee here, do you think it is fair? Do you think it is reasonable? Would you allow your child, do you think this is at the centre of the, putting the child at the centre of this, if at 15 you sign a one-year registration and then the club and only the club has the power to keep your son or daughter for a further three years without them having a say in it. There is no get-out clause. That's the two burning issues for us. Thank you. I could perhaps ask uh, very quickly Mr McKinley and Mr Doncaster just give a couple of comments uh, to Mr Robertson's uh, point. Um, I think, on, I think we've covered them, to, to be honest with you. I'll just sum on the, on the compensation uh, one. Uh, we feel that we have come up with something now which is much fairer, is much clearer, uh, and is properly based on a proper reimbursement of training co costs, which, as I said earlier, is something that we have a mandatory requirement to put in place from FIFA. Uh, in relation uh, uh, to the second point, I think uh, John has explained earlier on well the reason why 15 was seen as an important age you are right that there is no get-out clause. However, in practice, as I think we've talked about several times this morning, in practice, where players have looked to get out, that has often happened. Mr Doncaster? I, I, I agree with that. I think we've, we've ended up with what is now a very fair and balanced system, uh, which understands and reflects uh, the, the interests of, of young players as well as it does the clubs. It's imperative that we uh, retain a real incentive for clubs to continue to want to expend huge amounts of money on training young players. And we need to be very cautious about doing anything that is going to remove uh, uh, that incentive. Because if we end up in a situation where we have the, 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 the freedom that perhaps some are looking for, but clubs don't want to train any players anymore, I do not believe that that would serve Scottish football or, or Scotland in any way. Do you have a very quick point from Angus MacDonald? Yes, thanks. We heard earlier uh, an allegation that young players are not playing because clubs can't agree on compensation. Uh, what do you say to that? Oh, uh, nothing to agree. There's a clear um, uh, matrix which gives the amount. Whether or not a club is, wishes to pay that amount for a player is entirely up to that club. It just seems crazy to have, if there, if there are uh, players sitting idle for want of a better word, you know, sure. Yeah, and, and that's why often agreement is reached that no compensation is paid or a lesser amount is taken by the other club. But there is an amount set based on reimbursement of training costs for the clubs that have yeah. spent a lot of money. Okay. Just a very quick point, from Mr Murray, because I need to move on. I don't know anyone who would want their sons to go there to achieve something better. I think they're going from grassroots football to senior clubs, which I think is an incentive for players to go and improve with better coaching, qualified coaches and a better structure. I don't know any parent wouldn't want that for any of their children. And I can assure you that up to 14, any kid can walk in a club any time they want. And I've not seen any instances where you come up to these statements about certain things. You have three and a half thousand players paying, and we have to pick from that the cream of the crop. And that is the job. You use grassroots football. I have teams in Edinburgh who have three and four teams of the same age group all paying money per week to play football. Every club in Scotland, the 42, do everything free of charge to the players. 
Everything is done for these players regarding their health, their nutrition, their football training, and everything else. Yeah. I'll bring Mr. Robertson at a later date because I've got to get through a couple of other questions. Mr. Torrance? It's mainly be answered, but anybody could add anything additional. Um, under the new compensation schemes, what are the positive but also the negative aspects for young players? From my point of view, um, we recognise that clubs uh, should be entitled to compensation at some stage, but only when the player signs a professional contract. We forget that some of the greatest players that ever played football for this country, unfortunately, have not come through the pro youth system or Academy Scotland. When you look at the Soonesses and the Dalglishes and the rest of them, where are they now? Where are they? Compensation for those players was not in place and was not necessary other than an official transfer for the professional clubs after they graduated through the boys' club system, which is far, far, has proved in the past to be far superior than the pro youth system in terms of turning out the highest quality of players. Do Mr Doncaster or Mr McKinley wish to come in at that point? Going back, uh, going back 30 or 40 yeah. years is, is perhaps uh, not particularly relevant to today's uh, environment. Um, I believe that we have a, a very fair balance system in place. Um, I believe that the interests of young players are properly protected and where there is any suggestion of wrongdoing or breaches of rules, those suggestions uh, are taken very seriously and, and we, uh, we have a good track record of pursuing uh, breaches uh, by our member clubs. Thank you for that, Mr Murray. I think that is a totally irrelevant argument to say that. I can't believe you with that statement. I think, I remember years ago people thought the world was square and it wasn't round. It made coal fire, it was central heating. Things have changed, things have evolved, and football's evolved, and I think that argument is totally, totally unbelievable. I must admit that. Uh, Amber Taggart, that's question eight. Thank you, convener. Um, and you've probably been asked this question to death and answered it to death, but you're getting it asked again. Um, just to drill down on it ever so slightly more. In what respect does the new scheme offer improvement? Mr McKinley? I think it offers improvement because it's, it's far clearer and it's properly tied in to the amounts that clubs have actually spent. We, we have this obligation to put in place something which does properly reimburse clubs and we, we believe that you know, every club will spend a different amount, so we, we don't want a system where you go down to it's different for absolutely every club. We want something that's workable, but we feel we've, we've reached a good balance here that, that's something that shows you the higher up you are, the more you've spent, uh, and, and that, that's why we feel it's a, a fairer system. I'm a target. Uh, just on the back of that, um, particularly in the smaller clubs, to what extent does the compensation scheme support youth development? I think again, they're still they're still reimbursed for 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 the money that they they put into it. John probably will give you more on this, but clubs find find their own levels and they're happy to to work at their own levels. Some of them aspire to go up. Uh, we audit it every year uh, in relation to our club academy Scotland star ratings, and you do find, as you'd expect, some clubs wish to go up the star ratings. So that option is there for clubs. Um, Chip Brody. Yes, thank you. One last question. In terms of the investment, some of the public funding uh, and the speculation that goes on, how do you measure the outcomes and success of this new process, given the current state of Scottish football in terms of attendances and general success? How do you measure the outcomes? Mr McKinley? Mm. I'll, I'll try not to, to ramble on too much about this. The, a couple of years ago, when um, the, the chief executive, uh, Stuart Regan, uh, came to the Scottish Associ Football Association, there was a lot of work done uh, around bringing in place a new performance strategy. We have Club Academy Scotland, we also have performance schools. We have various other things which hopefully, will be, and it was called a 2020 vision for obvious reasons, we may not know until 2020 whether or not we have been successful in that. However, what I would say and it is very current, is we are seeing some good signs of things happening. For the first time in a long time, we won the Victory Shield at schoolboy level last year. We have just this last week had an under-17 teams in the finals in Malta who got to the semi-finals of the European uh, tournament, first time ever at that age level. So I I'm very hopeful that we are seeing things, but I'm Scottish. It's the hope that kills us. And... 
you know, let's, let's hope that these things do, do come through in time. And you will only be able to measure them in hindsight. That is a difficult one. Yes, Mr Murray. On the basis of the club system, I understand that the Scottish national team, but I think the main job I have at the moment is to develop players for Hearts Football Club. But we've got loads of players, as do all other clubs around Scotland, playing for lower leagues teams, uh, lowland leagues, first division, every league in Scotland, there's Hearts players playing in. We've also got players playing for boys clubs. And our aim at Hearts is to get players into Hearts, developing the good players to move on to a higher level, to achieve better standards for Scottish players. But it's a fact that 99.99% of the players in the national teams come from the top probably 12 teams in Scotland who invest the money because they want the best players. And that's the same anywhere in the world. We're no way different than anyone. So we're measuring out on the financial benefits No, no, any other benefits? No, I look at players who develop to go and you've achieve said, better things. You've just said they talked about the money. No, the, that's the, what this I is about. The top 12 teams produce the players. No, the money is not. The, the moment we pay money out to develop players, boys clubs get money in for parents to develop, for the grassroots football. They're self-financed. The clubs pay a lot of money to develop players for, for Hearts and for Scotland. We're now going to the last minute. Yeah, so I'd like to ask Mr Robertson and Mr Smith to uh, have a very quick comment. If you can keep it under a minute, Mr Robertson, that would be very grateful. I will. I just wanted to come quickly back to Mr Doncaster, who said that the 15-year-old that can then be held captive uh, for the three years, the clubs feel it's important. The clubs want that. The clubs feel it's the, the, the right age to identify in which to, to put that mechanism in. This is not what is best for the clubs. This is not why we're sitting here today. It's what is best for a 15-year-old boy. Not a football club, a business. It's what is best for the player. The player has to be at the centre of the decision-making process, not the club. Uh, uh, Mr Smith, I, I made a up. final comment there earlier on. Uh, so my last comment in relation to what's been produced for the money that's been invested that Mr Brody was going on about earlier. And thank goodness the Scottish team, in terms of the pool, has now something like about 12 players in it, between 10 and 12 players, selected who were born in another country, play in another country. That tells me, Mr Murray, the system is failing the country because you're not producing the players for it. Uh, thank you. Um, and I'll, can I put just a very last word to Mr McKinley and Mr Doncaster? Obviously, we're here. There is a wider issue here, but I just remind people that we're talking about the merits of the petition, and our job is obviously to look at how we can take the petition to the nth degree. That's the job of our committee. So, uh, Mr McKinley? Just very briefly, I, I think, as in fact, the answer to your first question, uh, Mr Chairman, was the steps that we have made in the last two years. We've made uh, a good number of, of, of changes. I think there will always be some rules which, which my friends don't like. And um, until, uh, until we change them, then I'm, I'm sure that they, they, they'll be not be happy and they will continue with that pursuit. And I understand that. Quick word from, final word from Mr Doncaster. Not much to add, Chair. I, I feel that the Scottish football has made a number of very positive changes uh, over recent years. I do believe that the system we have now is a very fair system that looks after and protects the interests of players and uh, where issues have arisen, where concerns have been expressed, we have addressed them proactively in partnership with the Scottish FA. And well, can I finally thank all of our witnesses for attending today. I know there's some difficult issues and there's been some fairly fierce words about it, but at the end of the day, I think we're all interested in football and we're all interested in uh, young players uh, and I think what this committee will, will do now is go away and consider the evidence and at a later date um, we'll look at the next steps for this petition if the committee are agreeable on that but could I finally thank each and every witness today for coming along I've really appreciated all your comments and I'll suspend for three minutes to allow our witnesses to leave thank you very much
Colleagues, if we can uh, restart our committee, we're on agenda item two, consideration of new petitions. Uh, the next item is PE 1515 by Mike Napier on asylum in Scotland to Glasgow University Rector Edward Snowden. Members of a note by the clerk, the spice briefing of the petition. Could I welcome the petitioner, Mr Napier? You're very grateful for coming along, Mr Napier. I appreciate your time. I can invite you to make a short presentation of around uh, five minutes. That will be followed by questions from myself and my colleagues. Mr Napier. Thank you. Um, five minutes is obviously very short to deal with a topic as vast as the government harvesting every single keystroke from everyone's computer and every single uh, email, every single text message, every single uh, search and uh, millions and millions of webcam images. Um, but let me try. Edward Snowden was elected by an unprecedented number of Glasgow University students by electing him as rector, they are making a statement against saturation surveillance by the National Security Agency in the USA. And the information in the public domain, which Edward Snowden has placed there, which is massively uncontested, um, the interpretation of it may be contested, but the information he's put in the public domain of saturation surveillance by the American and British governments of every single citizen is uncontested, and we owe him a huge debt. The aim of this petition is to ask the Scottish Government to offer Edward Snowden asylum in Scotland now, conditional upon a yes vote on September the 18th. Now, whether the people around this table are in favour of a yes vote or no on September the 18th, all can support the notion that a whistleblower like Edward Snowden, to whom we owe a great debt, should be uh, offered political asylum. He's in Russia at the moment. Um, when the Americans cancelled his passport, when he was trying to get to South America, he was locked up for 39 days in the, uh, the sort of stateless person room at Sheremetyevo Airport, during which time he applied to 21 countries for political asylum. US pressure prevented any of them from acceding to his request. He says he'll take political asylum in any country that respects free communications and freedom of the press. Uh, the fact that he's in Russia is now being spun to, say, to suggest that there's something untoward about his situation in Russia. And I'm really reminded of the old, uh, I think it was Yiddish story, of the man who murdered both his parents and then asked for clemency from the court on the grounds that he was an orphan. The Americans are now saying because he's banged up in Russia, there's something untoward about his relationship with Russia. But he's striving with might and main to exit Russia and get to some other country which will offer him asylum. I don't have time to, to go through the whole thing, but in question time, I can look at the various different programs that Edward Snowden has put in the public domain, which shows that you are being uh, surveyed almost every second of your working life through uh, harvesting that uh, data. Um, uh, he's a fugitive. He is trying to get here. He, we owe him a debt of gratitude. I think the, the, the final point I'd like to make in five minutes and 300 seconds is that whistleblowers are people who deserve our support, not just people like Edward Snowden, who reveal something that's of great importance to all of us, and it may be that he's right that every single child born today will never have any private life. But whistleblowers in the NHS, and only last month, um, Dr. Raj Matu uh, was vindicated after many years of being suspended for pointing out that patients were dying unnecessarily because of cuts. Uh, Jimmy Savile, as we know, uh, committed horrific offences over many, many years, even decades, while the talk in the BBC canteen was quite often, what the devil is somebody going to do about him? So whistleblowers need support, and if whistleblowers don't get support, those who are potential whistleblowers in revealing illegality, misdemeanor atrocities and so on, are intimidated. I think many people would suggest there's a democratic deficit in our society. Whistleblowers play a part in mending that particular gap. So with five, with, I hope I haven't overshot my five minutes by too much. Edward Snowden has revealed information to us that we would not otherwise know. It is of significance to every single citizen in Scotland. Uh, he acted out of the purest of motives and uh, an offer of asylum to the man by an independent Scottish government, an offer made today conditional upon 
uh, an outcome in September would itself be news and would allow the members of this committee to strike a blow for a private life for all of us. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Napier, for your, uh, the depth of your comments and keep them within time. And perhaps just from a personal view, should perhaps congratulate Glasgow University for electing Edward Snowden as rector in, in absentia. I think, with, uh, I think the other track record with that was uh, Winnie Mandela, if my memory serves me correct as well. So I think that was an uh, excellent result. Carlos, a couple of questions. I wasn't going to actually ask this, and, and, but your comments have triggered a comment to my mind. You were suggesting that the NSA would have been spying on Scottish citizens uh, as well. Um, is there any evidence in Mr Snowden's um, information that that was actually the case, that uh, American agencies were spying on Scottish citizens? Um, there are, he's revealed many programmes, but five in all, five significant ones. Um, they can spy on any individual anywhere in the world, as long as they have an email address. Um, one programme, Tempera, uh, collects all emails, texts, browsing histories, passwords, webcam pictures, and even a Facebook post which you decide to recall and not to send, they are actually harvested. So it's not just what you send that's harvested, it's what you might even think about sending. The German Justice Minister, and the Germans have experience of the Stasi opening a lot of letters, uh, called uh, the GCHQ's harvesting of emails in this country uh, nightmarish. And Edward Snowden has gone on record as saying that the GCHQ, I can't remember the adjective, but is much worse than the NA. I think he used the adjective vicious, is much worse than the National Security Agency in the USA in its approach to harvesting uh, information from citizens who are not even suspected of any wrongdoing. Perhaps it may be a, um, an argument for another day on this one, but I was interested in the comments you made. Just a couple of practical points. I think you've partly answered this. Um, Clearly, the UK uh, currently um, has a, a duty and a role over asylum. You were saying that America um, persuaded a lot of his allies not to allow asylum. I take it there's been an official answer from the UK government that they will not grant asylum to Mr Snowden. Uh, I hope it won't come as a great surprise that of the 21 countries that Edward Snowden applied for asylum to, I have no record that he even thought of the UK, given the way in which the, Mr Cameron is in bed with Mr uh, Obama. Uh, so he didn't even think of applying. He thought it was a lost cause. I think, uh, I think Scotland would be, would be seen as quite different. Um, so, I mean, obviously, I won't get pedantic with you, but clearly, if we're in the current arrangements, um, if the UK uh, granted asylum, it could, it could be, that could be within Scotland, mm -hmm. since we're still part of the UK. Um, but I was just wanting on the record whether there was a decision by the current UK government on asylum or not. As far as I know, none. Okay. Uh, that he would not think that coming to the UK under the present government would be a safe haven. Stand appointment. Thank you. And my final point before I bring my colleagues in, um, you'll be well aware um, with your background that the, uh, if there was a yes vote that uh, asylum would remain uh, reserved until March uh, 2016 um, and thereafter it would be a competence uh, if it was a yes vote for the new um, Scottish Government to make a decision on asylum or not. Have you had any indication from the current Scottish Government whether there, there, there is likely to be favourable to Mr Stone's application for asylum in the event of a yes vote? Uh, correspondence was, I think, very unsatisfactory. The reply was, we will deal with each case, uh, with each application on a case-by-case -case basis in the future. So I don't think it's appropriate to say we'll deal with Edward Snowden on a case-by-case -case basis. I think we all owe him a favour, and I'm very disappointed in the response of the Scottish Government to the correspondence. Thank you, Mr Napier. I'll bring my colleagues in. I think Cameron Buchanan wished to uh, get in, and then I'll bring in Chip Brody. Good morning. Thank you. I just was more in question of the fact is if he gets, it's not really the details of it, if he gets asylum and we are independent, surely the Americans would still ex could still put a petition to extradite him, and that would cost a lot of time and money. He wouldn't get away with it, would he? That, that would be my worry, or the worry more from the point of view that he, he, would, he would be extradited from Scotland to the United States. Well, first of all, it has to be a crime. Um, Glenn Greenwald and the team of journalists who have been releasing his information into the public domain have just been awarded the Pulitzer Prize. It's very clear that he's a whistleblower, that no crime has been committed, no foreign state is involved, and, uh, and if the Americans wish to extradite someone, they have to specify a crime. No crime has been committed. Thank you, Edward Snowden should be the appropriate response, not, uh, not a jail sentence. Well, excuse me, we've got, we've got the example of the Westminster bankers who have been, been sent to, extradited from the UK to America with long jail terms. America doesn't have a very good record of this sort of thing. 
of whether they committed a crime or not under our extradition treaty. They could extradite him on, on, in sort of spurious grounds, could they not? And I would be worried that this could come up. You know, it would cost us a lot of money, or cost us a lot of time and money. The last, uh, another individual who was elected rector by Glasgow University students in 2004 was an Israeli whistleblower called Mordechai Vanunu. Um, he was lured to Rome and then kidnapped, injected, and taken in a speedboat to Israel and suffered 20 years in prison, including 12 in solitary confinement. He's still detained in Israel and not allowed to leave. So yes, there's always a possibility of kidnap. There's always a possibility of extradition. But I think uh, given that Edward Snowden would like to leave Russia, would like to come to a country with a free press and free communications. It would be an honour, I think, for, for Scotland for him to come here. Uh, he's a planetary figure. Most Americans consider him a whistleblower rather than a traitor. Um, I think the discourse that treats him as a criminal is a minority discourse, and I would ask this, petition, this, part, this committee to act on the basis that we owe him a huge debt of gratitude for bringing into the public domain this uncontested information about saturation surveillance of all of you as well as myself and everyone in the room. Good and then John Wilson. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, where to start? I think uh, what Mr Snowden did was, was brave. Uh, I tend to look at somebody also like Michael Moore, who I'm not the former Scottish Secretary, but the American a writer who has indicated many uh, of the actions of the United States, and of course it's not just the United States, we've heard the news this morning uh, of China versus the United States in terms of, of uh, leakage of information or seeking of information. My problem with this is, you know, how do we change, how would we change this surveillance, which of course we know goes on. And as you rightly point out, of each and every one of us, which is wholly unacceptable. I just don't know why offering a Mr. Snowden asylum here, how we're going to change that ethos, because it will still go on. Uh, I sympathise with his case. Uh, you know, I think that he certainly has done a lot of people favours by, by declaring the information, but I just wonder... It's offering him an asylum here is not going to change anything, is it, in terms of the problem that we currently face in terms of not having open governments or leaders who are unable to open their governments. One could have said the same thing about any other major world issue in the past, slavery, women not having a vote and so on, that a single action would not solve the problem. No one, no one suggests that it does. But can I, can I go back to the previous question about, about illegality? The, the American president's own body, the uh, Civil Liberties Oversight Board, found that, this, that these programs were illegal. So the burden of proof to, to escape from criminal accusations is not on Edward Snowden, but on those running the programs. In terms of Edward Snowden being here, um, it would, I think we need a discussion. We need a conversation. I mean, Snowden uh, went on record a couple of weeks ago as saying that at least the worst thing that he feared hadn't happened i.e. that his revelations would be ignored, that there has been a worldwide discussion about this issue. It is in the public domain. The higher up the agenda it can be pushed, the better for all of us. There's no magic bullet. There's serious problems of technology here that the key, every single stroke of your keyboard can be harvested. This was not possible in the past. When I watched spy movies as a kid, uh, the fact that letters were opened between the post office and one's address was seen as ominous and dark. Now every single keyboard can be harvested. So there are fundamental problems. There's no magic bullet, but at the very least we need a declaration of principle. The First Minister has made a declaration of principle that such intrusion is unacceptable and ominous. You've done the same thing, Mr Brodie. We need more and more of that. We need a tsunami of opposition to this, and maybe a solution is going to open up. But allowing it to be swept under the carpet and GCHQ has issued an, a, a, a DA notice, some of you will know more about this than I do, to the BBC, uh, advising them very strongly, I think it's like a policeman asking you to pull over, not to run stories on one of, the, on one of these uh, surveillance activities and British involvement in it. So we are already being prevented from accessing information 
uh, the BBC is colluding in this. So, of course, are Microsoft, Google, Skype, uh, and Yahoo, and so on. They've been very docile, obedient in terms of the, the NSA um, in, in supplying all this information. So, I don't want to. Under, it's a gigantic problem, and there's no single solution. But it would be a declaration of principle. And in politics, I think you understand better than I. Symbols are very important. And an offer of asylum to Edward Snowden now would be news. His election as rector of Glasgow University was reported in, I think, about 200 newspapers and, and, and TV stations worldwide across the USA. These acts are significant, and I would ask the committee to, to take that action. Okay, thank you. John Wilson. Can I say I commend Philip Snowden for the act that he carried out and actually releasing the information and welcome this petition before the committee? I, the, no, I'm one of these individuals that may have been decried as a conspiracy theorist in relation to what's going on in the world and what the various governments are doing. But clearly what Philip Snowden highlighted was not just... Uh, sorry, Edward Snowden. It's uh, Philip Los Angeles, thank you. The, uh, the situation in relation to uh, NSA, but also in terms of G the involvement of GCHQ and the free exchange of information between the British security forces and the NSA, uh, particularly when many people don't actually realise that the US government runs a listening post in England that's ostensibly run from an RAF base, uh, but is almost predominantly staffed by American personnel linked to GCHQ, listening and monitoring and surveying every, or potentially every citizen in this country as well as Europe. So there is an issue we have to highlight, uh, as you've said, Mr Napier, about every keystroke, every uh, communication, whether that be by email or verbal communication on the telephone or mobile phone uh, or any exchange, could be being listened into and being monitored uh, by security services. So there is a, a, a high, I think it's good to highlight that situation so people are aware uh, that the wrong people are actually being prosecuted and persecuted for the actions that they took. However, I do have some concerns about the validity of the petition at the present moment uh, because my concern, convener, is that under the present treaty arrangement that the UK government have signed up to, with America, then if uh, Mr. Snowden was to come into UK soil, then he would be extradited. I think Cameron Buchanan highlighted that uh, under the existing extradition treaty that exists. And I think there is a wider debate that the, depending on what happens on the 19th of September this year, about whether or not an independent Scotland would actually honour that treaty agreement with the USA, because I think that we've got to go into that debate before we can commit ourselves to actually uh, giving sanctuary to anyone who seeks that uh, support uh, to come to Scotland, because I think there are discussions that have to take place. I would suggest, convener, uh, and I, I respectfully ask Mr Napier to comment, do you think it would not be a, not appropriate to hold off with this petition until we get the result of the referendum in the 19th of September so that we could actually then take forward this petition to actually get a, 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 a reasoned response from the Scottish Government based on what we can deliver rather than often false hope to Mr Snowden. Before I bring Mr Napier, just for information, I think John Wilson raises a very good point. Um, I had a look at the white paper last night. and page uh, 260, it says... Um, and I've summarised that an independent Scotland will obtain the current arrangements for extra extradition. Um, so I think that possibly answers uh, Mr Wilson's point, that, that that's been quite clear in the white paper, and that is obviously uh, the Bible one way, whatever way you view that, in terms of what will happen if Scotland was independent. So I think that point has been answered, but I certainly welcome Mr Napier's uh, view on what would you want this committee to do, because you're the expert on your petition. First of all, I think it's nice to have an offer it doesn't mean that it's, you're forced to take it up. And the offer of asylum to Edward Snowden would be the significant uh, part of this. He would obviously have to evaluate the risk of... Sadly, we live in an age where 
we know about rendition and people have been snatched and sent off for torture in countries I've, I've worked in. Um, so the record is pretty appalling in terms of people being kidnapped and tortured. Um, so anyone accepting an offer of asylum would have to evaluate the risks. But the offer itself would be a declaration of principle and would be a way of saying to someone that we oppose the harvesting of every keystroke. Can I just add one, one important thing that I've, I didn't have a chance to say in my opening remarks? I had, a, had an opportunity to spend some time that one doesn't often have uh, with a 27-year veteran of the CIA uh, who used to give daily briefings to a man called Ronald Reagan. He sometimes found him awake. But he gave him daily briefings on intelligence. He's a very significant figure in the CIA called Ray McGovern. And when I spoke to Ray McGovern, he said, look, this thing is being sold on the basis of fear, that it's a price you have to pay. It's a price you pay for protection against terrorism, um, blanket surveillance, saturation coverage. He said it's complete nonsense. The official American government bodies have come up with a figure for the number of terrorist attacks prevented by these saturation surveillance programs. I'm not very good at statistics, but I can remember the number zero. In fact, the biggest prize they could brandish in, 1920, in, 19, in 2007 was that a Somali taxi driver in America was transferring $8,500 to Somalia. God knows what it was for. It could have been for his family. But that was the trophy that cost billions of pounds in saturation. So an insider from the CIA, from the upper echelons of the CIA, is going public to say these, the price that we've been asked to pay is a price that gives us no protection whatsoever. Okay. Well, fact, can, just before I bring Mr Brodie in, I, um, I thought it would be useful for the committee to get um, a strong steer from yourself on the next steps. I think Mr Wilson was suggesting, I mean, one option is that we could defer consideration to after the referendum for obvious reasons. Obviously, another one is that we write now to the Scottish Government to ask their views, although I think you've already possibly identified correctly um, what the Scottish Government's view will be. I mean, which of that or the other options would you prefer this, this um, committee to follow through? The worst thing for anyone who's a fugitive and been victimised for doing something noble whether it be in solitary confinement, in prison or whatever, is the, f is the feeling that you're alone. One can suffer greatly with the idea that people out there know what's going on, but the idea of being isolated uh, can be very demoralising. Uh, Snowden's election by Glasgow University students was very... Uh, uh, he felt great afterwards. It made him feel good, even, in, even being, being, when exile is being used as a punishment against them. So I would ask the committee to push the, this petition as vigorously as possible, as quickly as possible, and that the offer be made. The, uh, the acceptance of the offer would have to follow an evaluation. But the reason I ask for that is that this saturation surveillance is happening today, tomorrow, and millions and millions of our uh, emails and texts are being harvested. So I think it's a very urgent, dangerous situation uh, it goes well beyond the nightmare scenario. The imagination of George Orwell could not encompass this power by Big Brother. And I think, uh, given the, 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 the size of the challenge, if I can say the danger, the response needs to be commensurate. And I, I would ask that we don't get up too close and look too closely at the future extradition arrangements following... The, the referendum may be, may, be, may be yes or no in, in result, but an offer by... A, a, a statement of position by this committee would be... Well, I was interviewed by the Russian news agency and a couple of other international news agencies today. This, the deliberations of this committee are going to be significant. So I would ask us to take a position of principle um, and, and, and to push the petition as vigorously and as quickly as possible. Um, just to be clear then, that I'm understanding you correctly, would you wish us to write to the Scottish Government and ask the Scottish Government's assessment of this situation? Would that be useful or would you wish it to... It doesn't sound like you wish it deferred until after the referendum. I would not wish it to be deferred, uh, uh, Chair. I would wish you to write to the Scottish Government and ask for a clear answer. I would wish you to take any steps within your power. I don't know to what extent you can... Um, uh, stimulate any debate inside other sections of the government, but I would ask you to take every step that you possibly can. Thank you. Mr Brody? Yeah, just briefly, in, in when you alluded to um, Scottish Futures, I'm so glad that you've, you've read it, Convener. Uh, I would hope that... <laughs> Were you any, any doubt, so Mr Brody? <laughs> I'll ask you questions later. In the issue of extradition, there would have to be, I would hope, going forward, evidence of criminality. And I think that is quite important 
going forward in terms of uh, we had a situation with uh, the hacker's name it escapes me uh, that ran for about five years, four years, five years. Uh, the young Scots uh, Scots guy. So uh, just for clarity, I think you know, when we talk about things like this, we need to be very clear mm. as to the principles that, that would be applied mm. in terms of looking at international agreements. John Wilson. Convener, just to, one question to Mr Napier. Do you think it would be appropriate for this committee to offer false hope to Mr Snowden regarding political asylum if on the 19th of September uh, and beyond the 19th of September, irrespective of the outcome of that referendum, the, the extradition treaty with the United States is not revoked? There are, there are moments... There are huge issues at different periods in history, and this one is the big issue today. Um, I don't think that Mr Snowden is naive. He has taken this step. He's given up, as he said, living in paradise in very secure conditions, high salary, great life, and he's taken a step, and looking back on it, he is pleased that he did so, despite the dangers, despite, according to very reputable US media sources, elements inside the American intelligence community openly discussing the option of killing him. And this has been discussed in the media as well. He's, 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 he thinks he took the right step. He will not think that the offer of asylum by a committee or by a group of parliamentarians means that it's a done deal and that he should buy a ticket from Moscow to, uh, to Presswick or Glasgow. But it will be a morale booster. It will be a signal, by the way, to, more importantly, to people in Scotland that there are people inside the parliament who view the saturation surveillance gathering very, very seriously indeed, because not much is coming out uh, from the political domain that this issue is, given, is treated with the gravity that it undoubtedly deserves. So I think this would be newsworthy, and it would be newsworthy as a declaration of principle. And if I may say, and I, I exclude people inside this room, politicians currently have a very poor reputation indeed. They are very low in public esteem, and this is a young parliament and hopefully will escape the opprobrium of their partners in Westminster, where the majority had to return money uh, wrongly obtained in the last parliament. But I think this is an opportunity for parliamentarians to change that, uh, to win back public esteem by being seen to take a stand on an issue of principle, and the details can be ironed out later. Mr. I, I would love to continue longer with this debate, as I'm sure you've uh, identified, but unfortunately we have other petitioners back. If you could just remain for a second. We're now finished the questions, um, and it's for the committee to make the decision, as always. So we're at the summation point, so we have to decide what we do with the petition, as you'll be aware. Um, you've helpfully given uh, some advice to us on next steps, but again, this is for committee members to look at next steps. Um, I mean, my own view is I think there is merit in asking the Scottish Government its view. You've probably... Um, identified what you think the view is, but I think as always be normally right to the Scottish Government when, because it does uh, deal with the Scottish Government function. But again, I'd like to, my colleagues just to uh, see their individual views on this matter. Chip, Chip Brody? A uh, difficult give you uh, As I said earlier, I sympathise uh, with what Mr Snowden did, was forced to do. Um, I take the point that John Wilson made about offering false hope and while a letter to the government might um, produce the same answer that Mr Napier has had from the Scottish Government, I just wonder if it's wise to do anything. And this is not a, what's the phrase, kicking it into the long grass, that it's wise to do anything until we know the situation uh, after September the 18th. Uh, I don't like unnecessarily prolonging decision making, but I just... I'm conscious of um, in Mr. Snowden's position, um, but I'll go along with the um, general committee. Uh, John Wilson. Convener, I think, uh, as I've already outlined, uh, I've got general sympathy with the petition that's before us, and if it was in our gift, and I mean the gift of the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament, I would like to see us being able to give political asylum to Mr. Snowden. However, given that we don't have, that it's not in the gift of the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government at the present moment, and it, I do feel that it will be subject to negotiation, and the, the convener's quite rightly pointed to the white paper 
uh, which clearly outlines, and uh, for paragraph 260, convener, 200, page 260, uh, that there would be the intention of the, a potential future Scottish government to uh, honour that extradition treaty that I think I would be minded to actually delay further consideration of this petition until after uh, September the 18th to allow us then to take forward a debate uh, within this parliament, within this committee, about the wider issues that this political asylum uh, petition seeks in relation to not only Mr Snowden's life and liberty, but also the issue about extradition treaties uh, with a country that seems to uh, flout international law. Uh, and uh, that would be my opinion. Thank you, Mr Wilson. Uh, Anna Taggart. Um, it's clear that it's not within our gift, um, and I think the Scottish Government have clearly indicated in page 260 what their intentions are um, if, if there was a yes vote on September the 18th. I, I'm not really sure of the merits of we've already... Mr Napier has already written to the Scottish Government. They have already indicated their response, um, of which obviously isn't of Mr Napier's satisfaction. However, I'm not sure if we as a, a committee would receive any other response differently. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, thanks, MacDonald. <coughs> uh, thanks, Convener. F firstly, can I, can I say I certainly um, have some sympathy uh, with the a petitioner, and uh, he's certainly spoken passionately uh, about his case today. Um, as has been uh, mentioned by yourself, Convener, we're, we're limited to the action uh, that we can take. Um, even with a successful yes vote, Scotland won't be independent until March 2016. <coughs> so it would be a decision to be taken by the new Scottish Government of whatever colour um, that might be. Um, and I note the, the, the request by Mr Napier to move speedily uh, with the petition, but um, there are issues with regard to um, Mr Snowden's uh, temporary asylum. I believe Russia has only granted temporary asylum for a year, so perhaps you know, the 21 other countries that, have, that he's applied to for uh, political asylum, perhaps there could be some intervention from one of them before his, political, before his uh, a temporary asylum is up. Um, so I would tend to concur with um, the general feeling of the committee that uh, given that there are these two issues, the temporary asylum that he currently has in Russia and uh, waiting to see the result of the referendum in September, we should defer further action until after the referendum. Can I from uh, Mr Torrance and then Cameron Buchanan? Defer to after the referendum. Can we be can? Absolutely. I think we should deter to the after. I think it'd be premature to deal with it now, just now. I don't think it's anything to do with Edward Snowden in this case. I just think he's not really within our competence. And I don't think there's any point in writing to the Scottish Government because it won't matter. Well, uh, thank you, no. colleagues. Well, uh, Mr. Nepal, obviously, you've heard, I think all of us are very interested in your, in your petition. Um, I think the majority opinion is clear that we need to defer. That doesn't mean that the petition is concluded. Uh, we would obviously wish to keep you carefully up to date after the referendum and discuss this uh, issue further, obviously, depending on the result on September the 18th. But I could finally could I thank you so much for your contributions. I think you, you've um, made an excellent contribution, both in your five minute yeah. and the way you've answered the questions. I think you're really an example. How how, to other petitioners of how to deal with petitions in this parliament. So can I congratulate you on your performance today and are suspend for two minutes to allow our witnesses to change rounds. Thank you.
can continue with our committee. We're on the second. We're on the second new petition. It's PE 1522 by Simon Brogan on improving bulk fuel storage safety. Members have a note by the clerk, the spice briefing on the petition. Could I welcome the petitioner, Mr. Brogan? Uh, you're very welcome, Mr. Brogan. Thanks for coming along. If you could give us a brief presentation of around five minutes to set the context of your petition, I'll kick off with a few questions, then my colleagues will add additional questions. Mr. Brogan. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, this is actually the second petition uh, that I've launched. Um, as a result of the uh, Bunsfield fire and explosion in uh, December 2005. The petition was launched in February 2006. Um, but more to the point, what am I uh, on to today? Kirkwall in Orkney has two bulk fuel storage sites in the town. Uh, one is the Kirkwall Power Station, owned by Scottish and Southern, which is very infrequently used since Orkney is connected by the grid through submarine cable to mainland, or, uh, mainland Scotland. But it holds two 500-ton tanks of diesel fuel at this power station. The Shaw Street Kirkwall fuel distribution depot holds 1,640 tonnes of diesel and kerosene, but by virtue of the fact that the fuel is for onward distribution, it doesn't fall under the water resources, sorry, water environment, oil storage, Scotland 2006 regulations. Now, the Kirkwall power station, which does fall under the water environment oil storage Scotland 2006 regulations means that it has to have um, modern bunding arrangements. Now, bunding is the secondary containment measure that's used to prevent damage to the environment. So you, the primary container is the steel tank. The secondary containment is the bund and there is a tertiary containment system where you gather rainwater or oil that's spilt within the bund and prevent it from going off site. So you have two bulk fuel storage uh, depots in Kirkwall, one used for onward distribution, the other used on site, one governed by a law which Scotland passed which means it has to have a more modern bunding arrangement. And Shaw Street Depot is not governed by that Act, nor is it governed by any other Act except the Health and Safety at Work Act. And given that the four out of the six tanks at Shaw Street were built in 1938, I think the Scottish Parliament has really got a duty to do something about this. If I was to describe to you that the nearest house to the nearest tank is 30 feet away, there are very close dwellings to this. It is in the sort of centre of the front of Kirkwall. It's a disgrace that it's still there and it's high time something was done about it. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brogan, for your pre presentation. Um, I am actually familiar with um, uh, the Shore Street uh, Kirkwall. In fact, I think I had, where in my hands, I had, had a surgery case to do with that. Ironically enough, when I was staying... When, At it together. Uh, uh, ironically enough, when I was staying in the Kirkwall Hotel, which was a hop, skip and a jump from the actual uh, depot yourself. So basically, if I understand your presentation, your concerns are about health and safety and preventing fire and explosions uh, in the future in Scotland by having a different regime. Would that be a fair summary of your petition? Uh, that is, uh, that's not a totally adequate summary because uh, <laughs> the, uh, the water environment oil storage regulations insist on an impermeable lining to the bund, including under the tank. 
and Scottish and Southern's power station in South Uist leaked 40 tonnes of diesel in November of 2008. And having just spent in 2007 a quarter of a million pounds upgrading the bunding, Scottish and Southern decided they wouldn't lift the tanks to put an impermeable lining underneath because it was going to cost too much, p do difficult, and be a problem. So the necessity for an impermeable lining throughout the bund can only be insisted upon if all these fuel depots that escape this water environment uh, oil storage regs uh, due to this arbitrary distinction of one lot use the diesel on site and the other distribute it. It, th there's no sense to this distinction of uh, onward distribution because, in point of fact, the um, oil storage uh, with an oil distribution depot means that there's a lot more oil coming and going. So there's more risk. The other, the other aspect then, of course, is uh, your worries about water pollution as well, of the diesel. This is the whole point. Yeah, but yeah. The, the, the thing about bunding is that uh, it, it is the bete noire of the oil storage industry. Because, you know, bunding has to withstand enormous fire hazards and temperatures, which, you know, create massive problems. They have to cope with rain. You know, you've got to deal, you know, a, bun, a sealed bun means it would fill with rainwater if it wasn't dealt with. It's a, it's, it's a problem, but it's the only way of securing the environment. Right, that's a very good point. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I ask if any of my um, colleagues would wish to ask questions, points, observations. Um, Angus MacDonald. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks, Convener. I'm listening to uh, Mr Brogan, it certainly seems he's, he, he has a, a very uh, a valid point. Uh, and well, hailing, hailing from Stornoway, which has similar issues uh, regarding bulk fuel storage, um, and representing Falkirk East, which has Scotland's um, petrochemical complex and refinery, uh, I'm certainly aware of the, the coma uh, regulations and the need to ensure following Bunsfield that um, there, there was proper uh, buns put in place. Um, uh, but as, as uh, Mr Brogan mentioned, the, the Scottish Government uh, has taken uh, action to ensure proper buns are in place, certainly in, in Grangemouth and in, in my constituency, uh, again following Bunsfield. Um, and there does seem to be an, 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 an anomaly, good grief, <laughs> with regard to um, a risk uh, whether um, the fuel is for use on site or for forward distribution. So I would, I'm, I'm not aware of the situation in Kirkwall, certainly looking at the Stornoway situation, if there's probably difficulty in getting the buns in place in such a tight area. And it might be that the, um, you know, the, the distribution companies uh, would have to look at uh, building bulk fuel storage sites maybe on the outskirts of the, the town instead. Uh, I don't know if that's the case in Kirkwall or not. Well, you, you've raised two points. First one, COMAR regulations, the control of major accident hazards. The fuel depot I'm talking about falls below the inventory threshold, which is 2,500 tonnes. So anything above 2,500 tonnes goes into lower tier COMAR, and they are highly regulated. So Kirkwall fuel station falls out of that. Now, with regard to the bunding, the size of the bunding, the height of the bund walls, is uh, predetermined, and I'm told that's OK. But it's the impermeable lining which Kirkwall fuel station doesn't have and which is insisted upon for all those bulk fuel that come under the Water Environment Oil Storage Scotland 2006 regs. So it's something that the Scottish Parliament can do. Yeah, I mean, certainly from, from the feedback, it, it does seem to be the case that, that, that mm. there is an issue, and we certainly need to raise it with the Environment Minister, for one. Most definitely. Yeah. 
Um, do other colleagues wish to have questions, points or observations? Uh, John Wilson. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, can I just get clarification on, from you, uh, Mr Brogan, about the definition of onward distribution uh, and what you consider to be the definition of that? Because my understanding is that the fuel that's in those containers can be in there, those containers for some period of time and they will be constantly topped up. So effectively, uh, this argument about onward distribution uh, doesn't really uh, stand up in relation to the dangers that may be presented uh, because of the inaction by the, either the government in relation to uh, applying the appropriate regulations or the operators of the site. I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the, what you're the, asking. The, que the question I'm asking is the definition of onward. The, what, the, what you've said in your petition yeah. is okay. that the exemption okay. uh, from the regulation or part of the exemption from the regulation is because the oil being stored is for onward distribution. Okay. Okay. Uh, and it's really trying to get your interpretation of what that definition really means. Because so you've got two types of bulk fuel storage. You've got the fuel that's stored on site to be used on site. In the case of Kirkwall's power station, it'll be burnt in the generators. Um, in the case of the Shaw Street fuel depot, the fuel is um, pumped from ships into the tanks. Uh, trucks, tanker trucks, are constantly being filled and driven away. So it's, it's imported and then distributed through the community. But the, the point I was trying to make, Convener, is the, how the fill, the fill these tanks can be at any one time or over a period of time. Because understand that the, the fuel is taken from tankers into the containers and then from the containers into the trucks for distribution. But it's the period of time in which that fuel can be lying in the, that depot before it goes for onward distribution. Well, it's, it's difficult to know. I don't know exactly how often the coastal tanker delivers oil to Kirkwall, but let's say it's on average every six weeks. So they hold 1,640 tonnes of diesel and kerosene, and it'll, they'll be filled, the tanks will be filled, and then in the course of that six weeks, the levels drop down until they organise for another boat to arrive. And the boat is shared. I mean, the boat comes up from maybe Grangemouth and it'll feed into uh, maybe Wick, Inverness, uh, Lairwick and Kirkhall. Thank you. And whilst at a sort of naive level, you could say that a lot of these oil tankers, um, a lot of these oil containers could be out with um, the main areas of the harbours, but of course for logistics, they're at harbours for good reasons, because the, the fuel is shipped in, so like Inverness for example has oil storage, so does Kirkwall, so does Western Isles, there's good solid reasons for it, but I think your point is, of course they have to be there, but you need to make sure that the, the proper bonding is in place and that hasn't always happened and the regulations don't always apply to them. Um, so I think you've made some very good points, unless members have any other urgent points, I would um, suggest we go to summation. If you just, if we are, Mr. Brogan, this is where you probably noticed from our previous petition, where we now decide the next steps. And, and certainly, my view is there's some very clear uh, next steps, uh, such as obviously Scottish Government, SEPA, um, Health and Safety Executive. I'm also quite interested, though, uh, interested in what the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service would say about this. Uh, and you've mentioned SSE. Uh, I think it makes sense to write to them and perhaps other parallel Absolutely. companies. Would members be agreeable to that collection of in Certainly groups? SSE. Yeah. We did. Would anybody have missed that you would uh, suggest that we write to? Are, you, are, are the committee... That, sorry. John? I, mean, I was going to suggest we write to Orkney Council to mm -hmm. ask them their views on this, yes. uh, because there will be a, an environmental health issue uh, that Orkney Council should have been considered uh, and whether or not they made any representation uh, to the government on this issue. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Angus MacDonald? Thanks, Commissioner. Presumably, there's a private company distributing the fuel uh, on Orkney, so it might be an idea. Brogan Fuels, I remember rightly, but uh, no yeah. relation. <laughs> so it might be an idea to contact them to, yeah. to get their 
Yeah. View I, as well. I think Highland Fields have a rule as well, do they not? Uh, no. Yeah. In, in Orkney, it's Scottish Fields, or more recently, they changed their name to Surtas. OK, so it's worth writing to them as well. Are members agreeable then to that collection? Of, yep. Um, so as you've heard, Mr Brogan, we're very interested in your petition. We're going to take it forward. We'll keep you up to date with developments. Um, and obviously, we're, we're try as we do for all petitions, to take it to the nth degree to make sure that you get satisfaction on the very genuine points you've raised. Can I thank you again for coming along. Safe journey back. And I suspend for one minute, because we're really tight for time today, um, to allow Mr Brogan uh, to leave. If we could continue with our committee, the third new petition uh, today is PE 1516 by Malcolm Lamont on referenda for Orkney, Shetland and, and the Western Isles. Um, members have a note by the clerk, the spice briefing and the petition. Uh, could I refer members to the note by the clerk um, and ask the members' views? Are members content uh, that this petition is admissible? Ask members' views. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Um, so members um, are content that the petition is admissible. So then, as with all petitions, uh, we need to look at the various options that are um, uh, possible. Uh, A, we can invite the petitioner to come and speak to the petition, um, or we could write to the Scottish Government and ask their view. Uh, we could defer the consideration to after the referendum, or take any other actions that the committee considers appropriate. Uh, can I ask for views from committee members? Well, for First of all, whether committee members feel it appropriate that we ask the petitioner to come in and speak, as we do for a number of other petitions. I don't think there's any necessity. No, we've already ruled on that, oh, so we can. Yeah. We're, now, we're now looking at actions for the committee. And the only other, um, the clerk's advising me that the only practical uh, issue is that I understand the petitioner is on holiday and might not be immediately available, but we will obviously ascertain dates if the committee are so minded uh, when the petitioner can come in. What's the committee's view on inviting the petitioner? Well, Jack first of all, because of the, the, the wide-ranging uh, issue that's been raised and not referring to any referendum fatigue, um, perhaps in the first instance we should write to the Scottish Government okay. to seek their views and then perhaps we can uh, based on that response consider whether or not we should have uh, Malcolm well, Lamont yeah. come in Thank you. So, Mr. I, just, that's just Sorry, one Mr. question yeah. I have yeah. perhaps the clerk's going it, it says in the petition how many signatures have you collected so far how many supporters of the petition have there been yeah. Um, we could get absolute confirmation, but it's over 2,000 signatures. Right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brody's suggesting then that we, in the first instance, write to the Scottish Government to ask their views, and once we get that back, we can work out the next, the next steps, which could be inviting the petition along. Are members agreeable to that, Mr. Wilson? I'm agreeable to uh, Mr. Brody's suggestion that we write to the Scottish Government to seek their views before inviting uh, Mr. Lamont along to a, a committee meeting. The only clarification I would seek, convener, is the title of the petition says referenda for Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles. Can I get clarification whether or not referenda is the correct terminology? My understanding from a linguist is that we should actually be using the term referendums because the plural of referendum is referendums uh, rather than referenda. Uh, so I would seek uh, 
some clarification on that at a future date as well. Yes, we will. Um, we will seek advice from a higher authority, um, but I always bow down no to Mr. Wilson's understanding of English. Um, um, so we've got a suggestion then we write to Scottish Government, get their view, and we will deal with this at a future meeting. Are members agreeable Agreed. to that? Thank you, Mark. I am conscious of, of time, uh, colleagues, but I will I'll take the petitions uh, as they are in order. This is the consideration of current petitions. I'm conscious we've got Eileen Smith is here, so I'm keen to, to reach Eileen Smith's item on the agenda. Um, but if time is against us, um, there is one final thing we need, need to do as far as the annual report is concerned. Um, but we'll just see how the time goes. Um, okay. Uh, can, I just, uh, can I just move to agenda item three, consideration of current petitions, where PE 1412 by Bill McDowell on bonds of Cation, members of a note by the clerk. Um, clearly, um, there's, we've dealt with this, I think, very good petition for uh, some time. Uh, there is a suggestion that we defer this till after the Scottish Government announces its next legislative programme. The Scottish Government has made it clear it does not intend to prioritise this work. And in, in its view, there's no clear agreement on the way forward in this and a number of related issues. For these reasons, it tends to consult when other, when other priorities allow. Uh, I think that seems to me a very strong steer that we do defer this until their announcement. But again, I'll take uh, advice and guidance from the committee. Okay. Are people agreeable? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, I'll then move to PE 1463, Ballerine uh, Cleaver, an effective thyroid and adrenal testing, diagnosis and treatment, members of a note uh, by the clerk, and submissions. I think we had a very interesting uh, round table on this issue. And Elaine Smith, MSP, has a long standing interest in the petition, and I welcome uh, Elaine Smith uh, to the meeting. Uh, we're a bit tight for time, which you'll be very familiar with in your other role. Uh, Ms. Smith uh, can invite uh, a brief contribution from you. Thank you very much, Convener. I do, and I want to thank the committee for the time they have taken so far in reading the evidence and understanding the scale of this issue, and in reading the personal stories, um, which I think we may agree were sad and tragic, given that medical help is available, and it's available in other countries other than the UK. So, for example, uh, in Belgium, Armour thyroid is prescribed. I think it's unfortunate the convener, uh, sorry, the, the, the petitioner Lorraine Cleaver. Um, can't be here, but she did submit a note highlighting um, her own dependency upon the, the, the desiccated thyroid hormone, and as you know, many others also rely on it. And I think it's, it's worrying that they were previously able to buy it from the USA, but recently the FDA seemed to be demanding prescriptions now to ship it into the UK. I think the question needs to be asked why this sudden change. Lorraine Cleaver seems to wonder whether it's at the instigation of the UK, so I think maybe there are questions in there. Um, obviously, that was the normal treatment, as we all know, prior to um, the, the patenting of T4, and it's quite literally bringing people back to life. Um, so this is where the worry is, that GPs could prescribe it as long as they take personal responsibility for the treatment, and um, it would obviously be better for people not to have to buy it from the US anyway, but to have their GPs um, prescribing it. I understand if they meet, they meet the guidelines, if they've tried the licensed product first, and obviously a lot of people feel that they're being um, denied health. And actually, people feel that, um, that the GPs might be breaking the Hippocratic Oath and denying them treatment that would, that would help them and is shown to help them, but they're having to purchase themselves from abroad. Um, obviously, there's, there's financial... The fact there's not financial benefits with desiccated thyroid hormone for the pharmaceutical companies. And that may be the reason, too, in your letter from the government... Um, I note that in that letter um, they talk about T3 and what, what they say in the letter, which is PE 1463TT. At the bottom of the page it says, um, it may be that companies do not see it in their economic interest to enter into such a small market. That's a possibility for why there's only one pharmaceutical company making uh, T3. And as we know, there was problems with that when... Um, when the, the, there was no supply of T3. There was also another shortage in March this year, convener. I don't know if you know that. Um, that was resolved again, but again, it highlights that there's only one supplier. And I think some of the evidence you've received for this committee meeting also um, shows some close ties between pharmaceutical companies and the medical profession. So if I just turn quickly to the listening exercise, um, I understand from Lorraine Cleaver's submission that she met with David Klein, and so she's pleased to be given the opportunity to contribute to that exercise. And I think it's good that evidence is being gathered um, because it affects so many people in Scotland. But I'm still not entirely clear, I don't know if the committee are, about how much of that is going to be focused on specifically on thyroid problems, which was something the committee had asked before. Um, personally, I would also be happy to contribute to that exercise if in any way whatsoever, and I hope it will be publicised that it is happening. So... 
given that you, you're short for time, could I just respectfully ask the committee um, to consider keeping this petition open until at least until the listening exercise is finished, but also again that the committee give some consideration to their own inquiry with a focus on issues like gathering the available clinical evidence, um, taking evidence from patients, including those who are parked on T4, to find out if they're actually well on T4 or what are the other symptoms that they're suffering, and also to consider why GPs will not prescribe desiccated thyroid hormone, which was the safe way to treat thi underactive thyroid conditions, um, when it clearly helps bring patients back to life and it keeps them economically active. So I think there are a lot of things in there that an inquiry could look into and that it would benefit many patients and also perhaps benefit the NHS in the long run. Thank you, Convener. Can I thank Elaine Smith for uh, coming along and, and giving that presentation? Um, there's been a suggestion from Elaine Smith that we keep the petition open and consider it again once the Scottish Government's project and patient experience is complete. Um, are members agreeable? Are members, are members okay. have additional okay. points to Elaine Smith first? Yeah, um, can I take John, Smith, uh, John Wilson first and then Chick Brody? Thank you, Convener. It was just an additional point. As I think Elaine Smith quite rightly uh, identified we don't know, in terms of the, the consultation that the government are currently, currently carrying out, how many thyroid patients will be in, involved in that. And the, the, the issue would, for me would be to, if we could write to the Scottish government uh, to find out whether or not they will do more detailed work in speaking to thyroid patients to actually find out uh, and get their contribution to this debate because there's no point in having waiting on the Scottish Government response and then only to find out uh, that thyroid patients weren't fully considered in terms of the evidence gathered and the report produced. So I would urge the committee to write to the Scottish Government now to ask to, for special consideration be made that thyroid patients are targeted uh, to ensure that they're getting the appropriate treatment. Thank you for that, Mr. Wilson. Check, Brody. Yeah. Firstly, can I say this is one of you know, since being on the on the uh, since joining the committee, it's probably one of the most thorough and and uh, mm. interesting is the wrong word, but you know, in terms of comprehensive uh, petitions that have been submitted. I, I was going to uh, make the same point as, as John Wilson. Um, I don't know in terms of the, the the remit or the terms of the government's project. But I would suggest that doesn't inhibit uh, people being encouraged to write to the government and detailing their experience. Thank you for that, Amit Tiger. Thanks, convener. Um, thank you, Elaine Smith, for coming along. Um, I think it's yeah, we we will have to wait on the listening exercise to be complete. Um, however, Elaine Smith um, has raised another number of um, issues that are, are outstanding and that haven't been answered in this, this petition we've had for a long, long time. Would it be possible for this group to do an inquiry as to, and, and just to answer all the questions that has been raised? There's, there's loads of different issues that are hanging out there, um, work that's not been done currently, and, and we do need answers um, for people with regards to this, and I'm not sure we're going to solely get those answers from the listening exercise, even if we do consider what Joan Wilson had mentioned earlier to ensure that thyroid sufferers be included within that exercise. Yeah, I thank Anne McTaggart for her comments. Um, I think it might be useful if we ask the, the clerk to look at the question in detail of the point of phrase, because obviously there would be considerable work for the committee, but I think all the committee members agree that this is an excellent petition. We want to go as far as we can with it, but I would like some guidance first just on work implications for the staff before we make a final decision. Um, other views from committee members? Uh, Angus McDonald? Yes. Thanks, Convener. Yeah, I would certainly um, like to hear from, from the committee clerks to see if uh, it would be possible to, to hold a um, uh, an inquiry. However, can I maybe just place on record uh, an acknowledgement that uh, I'm sure the petitioners must be feeling extremely frustrated mm -hmm. yeah. at the length of time that this mm -hmm. is taking. And uh, it's just to basically place that on record uh, that um, we, we understand the frustration. Yeah. Uh, do any members have any other additional points? So are, are we all agreeable then that we will, we're going to um, keep the petition open? Sorry, Mr. Wilson. Yeah, just one other question I'd like to ask the Scottish Government. Sorry about this, Convener. But the issue in terms of David Klein's response, uh, when he makes reference to this, the 
batches of T3 and availability of T3. Uh, and he's made reference to the fact that it's you no know, decisions over whether or not to manufacture particular medicines are for pharmaceutical companies. I think the issue for many of the, the thyroid patients is the supply of T3. It's not who manufactures it. And whether or not it's manufactured in the UK, it's about making sure if there is a pharmaceutical company who is producing that T3, that the access should be given to that, irrespective of what country it's being produced in. So it's to try, try and guarantee the supply, uh, and it would seek uh, clarification from the Scottish Government if T3 was not available in the UK from UK pharmaceutical companies, would they seek the import of T3 from other countries on the proviso that it met the strict guidance in relation to the material used and the eff effectiveness of that T3? Thank you for that. Um, do members have any uh, other comments? Or we quite clear how we're going forward then. We're going to continue this. We're going to wait the Scottish Government's project. We're going to get a note from the, the clerk on in future meeting to look at whether a mini inquiry would be possible. And could I finally thank Elaine Smith again and the petitioners for uh, coming along. I think this is a very, very good petition. And um, I'll just quick, uh, thank you for coming along, Elaine Smith, and I'll quickly move, uh, move on. Um, I'm conscious of time, uh, colleagues, that um, there's been quite a lot of pressure on our um, timetable today, and we've got a couple of petitions to reach, one of which at least there's uh, one of the petitioners in the gallery. Um, with, with your permission, could I uh, defer the Pete Gregson one, unless there's strong feeling, uh, to the next meeting and ask that we deal with PE1508 out of sequence? Would that be agreeable? Yep. Thank you. Um, PE1508 by Sean Clerken on Aptos as the sponsor for the 2014 Commonwealth Games. I think Mr uh, Clerken was at our, one of our previous meetings and gave, gave evidence. Um, members of a note by the clerk and submission. Um, could, could I ask for views of possible options for um, the committee? We've obviously written to a whole series of organisations about the issues raised by the petitioner. Um, can I first of all get a general view from uh, members on the next steps? Um, in, in, in the basis of silence, I'll move that there is a number of things that we can look at in this petition, um, but certainly as a recommendation that we close the petition on the basis of the work of ITAS IT is integral to the Games and a change of sponsor could undermine the smooth running of Glasgow 2014. However, in doing so, I think the committee could write to the organising committee drawing its attention to the, ev the evidence the committee has gathered on this issue so that the organisers are left in no doubt on the strong comments made by the petitioner which were very clear, and the evidence that we've gathered back as well. Are committee members agreeable to that course of action? Thank you very much for that. Um, could I move then to agenda item four, which is annual report. The final item agenda today is consideration of the committee's draft annual report to the Parliament year 11th of May 2013 to the 10th of May 2014. Uh, members will know that all committee reports follow a standard format, as agreed by the Communities Group. Um, and members have the draft uh, report. Uh, my own views on it, and I uh, think it looks um, uh, a straightforward account of what we've done. Uh, I couldn't see a, a reference to the plenary session we had on organ donation, uh, but I could be wrong in that point. But if not, I would suggest that we certainly add that. Um, and I don't know whether it's competent, but certainly the sessions we did with uh, Lombardy delegation was also useful with John Wilson and Chick Brodie, if that's appropriate, and the clerk can advise me if that's the case. Are members, agree members agreeable to uh, John Wilson? Can you remind me when we went to Stornoway? Uh, was it during the previous? But yes, I think that was in the previous Right, term. that's fine. It's just the, the yeah. timing of it. Just. Yeah. Yeah. But obviously, I think it's important that um, we do look at promoting as well as we can the committees. The committee are doing something unusual, different, innovative. We should be reflecting that in the annual report. And certainly for general committee reports, I was very impressed with the work that the conveners group had done on looking at uh, changing, if you like, the marketing and presentation of reports. And we will get that in due course. But it was very impressive. And it was a huge improvement to the rather staid approach. No reflection to the clerk's work on this. It's just the approach was a bit um, old-fashioned. And I think the new approach is much better. But we should get that automatically in the future. Are members agreeable then to the, or have any changes to the end report? Are members happy with the end report format? Thank you very much for that. No, sorry, uh, just, 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 one, one, yes. sorry, just looking at the inquiries and reports, I know this is a report of what we've done, um, but clearly uh, it, one that petition on 
child sexual exploitation has certainly left a double mark on me. Yes. And I'm sure every and and uh, there is no comment. In that we should do more. We, on we, should, yeah. we should do more on it. Well, I think what uh, I think I agree with Mr. Brody. Perhaps we can beef up the section on what we did in the report because that was a huge, huge. Yes, we'll, the clerk will circulate a form of words. Members agreeable with that format? Mm -hmm. And can I um, formally close the meeting and just ask if members could stay behind just for 30 seconds? And um, I'll just allow the gallery to clear. The meeting's formally closed.